Welcome to another episode of High Side, Low Side. It's hard to believe that this is episode six already, which means we're halfway through season five. I am Spurgeon. I've got Mr. Zach Quartz sitting here with me. Zach, how are you doing halfway through the season? Where does the time go, my friend? Where does it go? It I'm doing great. You're having fun. <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you very much. We are midwinter here in Southern California, so I'm suffering through yet another 50 degree 55 degree morning in my unheated podcast room, uh, for which I get no sympathy from Spurgeon or any other Northeasters. In fairness, it was 68 degrees here yesterday. I've been what? riding. I've been riding oh, the, uh, the 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 bike into the office every day this week. So good for yeah. you. Anyway, yes, sir. Anyway, <laughs> on today's episode, we've got a heck of a show for you. Ari Henning is going to be our guest. We're going to talk about packing tips for motorcycle trips. If that doesn't rhyme, I don't know what does. Uh, we are going to start off, as always, with some t-shirt winners, uh, a little bit of the news. We're going to get into listeners' comments at the end of the episode. But first and foremost, Zach, what do we have to do at the start of every podcast? Well, we have this problem here at RevZilla, just so everyone knows. We have way too many high side, low side t-shirts. We just, we literally can't give them away fast enough. No, no, no. I'm, we Before I'm, we get into that, I'm we're going to do an ad for Motul. So you, uh, you, I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to get you to get a, a lead into our sponsor and you're so excited to give away t-shirts. You forgot about Motul. I did. Oh. I really leaned into it super hard too. I didn't get much sleep last night, everybody. I do apologize. <laughs> um, but yes, we should talk about our sponsor before we give away t-shirts. <laughs> so Motul is gearing up to return. They, uh, uh, they sponsor MotoGP, and they do this really cool thing where um, they they offer Motul 300V oil to MotoGP riders. And we're bringing this up because by the time you're listening to this episode, uh, MotoGP in America down in Austin, Texas is only a few weeks away. And we're sure that there's a lot of you listeners out there that will be down in Texas. Um, but they 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 take the Motul oil out of the engines after it's raced in, and they use it to analyze uh, how their oil holds up in these high, you know, intense race situations. And they and use it to make their oil better. And tell people what the 300V is. It's their full synthetic line of racing oil. And the 300V oil, you can tell because it's green. And part Why of the- Why is it green, Spurgeon? Well- I don't know, because green is a beautiful color, and it's the color <laughs> okay. of emeralds. My eyes. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. But the 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 beauty of this is they, they integrate this into what they call a Go Green campaign. Um, because the oil is their full synthetic oil, it uses uh, less fossil raw materials. So when you go to watch MotoGP this year, whether you're watching it across the pond uh, or you're watching it down in Tejas, uh, you can know that Motul is down there making their oil better with every single lap around the track. Making it greener, literally and figuratively. Yep. And, and as always, uh, by supporting Motul, you support high side, low side. So we thank you for indeed. all of you folks out there using Motul products in your motorcycles. Okay. So Spurgeon, now what do we do on high side? Ah, high side? I'm glad that you asked, Zach. Now we're going to give away a T-shirt uh, oh to God. a lucky winner. And uh, if you have never listened to this podcast before, which I can't believe that this would be a first time for oh, anyone, okay. um, you want to make sure that you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, the reviews help people find the podcast. They help new listeners come into the fold. And to reward you for uh, leaving us a podcast, we like to give away a T-shirt. And Zach, I am going to let you take the winner today <laughs> the winner today is steel boy 925 um that's right steel boy we are going to read your comment are you ready for this uh steel boy 925 says <clears throat> and i quote congrats producer chase on the baby that's a very nice tip of the cap producer chase um the backstory yeah, there yeah. is uh producer our, our producer chase is having a baby and we Correct. talked about it in a previous episode his partner is, to be more specific, yes, but more yes, that's not the point. point. The point is, this was a very nice uh, a gesture by Steel Boy 925 to say, congrats to producer Chase on the baby. Um, and and this, is to for, say, for, this is, but this is where our producer Chase, who was reading the comments with us, true. stopped reading. He didn't true, read true. the rest of the comments. He's like, oh, some guy said something nice about me. And yeah. as soon as he heard that the flattering part for him was over, he stopped reading. Right. And, um, then and then Spurgeon Zach found I, the comment. Yeah. Right, right. We kept reading. And what we found was uh, Steel Boy said, My wife and I conceived our very own beautiful daughter listening to season three, episode two of High Side, Low Side. Uh, and also said, Listening to season four, episode five in the delivery room was great as well. Highly recommend. So, um, 
that we, poor child. <laughs> we can only assume that the the daughter's name is either high side or low side. Um, so please let us know when you can, Steve, uh, what name you settled on. Uh, and of course, most importantly, please send your preferred t-shirt size and mailing address to high side, low side at revzilla.com so we can give you a t-shirt. If we had a onesie, we, maybe we'd give you one of those, but I don't think we have any of those. We could buy like a white onesie and just use a Sharpie and write high side, low side on it and mail that that's, off. Real that, high quality. Yeah, that's that's in keeping with the production quality of high side, low side in general. So anyway. Darn tootin'. A All new, right, well, a new benchmark for uh, for high side, low side though. Um, <laughs> conception music. We, we, we just <laughs> we never saw that coming. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Oh my gosh! When you really think about what that means, it's really it 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 really hits home. Um, so kicking off things in the news, uh, just a quick mention: uh, Get On Adventure Fest is coming to the Mojave Desert in California, and then we are coming back to the Black Hills as well in July. Uh, but for those of you that would be interested in joining Zach, myself, and the rest of your hosts riding adventure bikes in Southern California, April 21st through the 24th, you can head over to revzilla.com slash fest, and you can get all the information on that. That's fest, as in the first four letters of festival. <laughs> uh I do hope as many I'm as having possible. fun already. I want to take a break and just say that like, I know it might sound like a rough start to a lot of you, but I am genuinely I'm genuinely laughing. So Zach, you're <laughs> yeah. on fire today. You are on fire. Yeah, it's like I said, I just need to not get very much sleep and make you in charge of the schedule so I don't say the wrong thing at the wrong time <laughs> and then everyone's happy. Everyone wins, I guess. Um move along with the news, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Spurge Dirch. Um we tripped over the story about Isle of Man TT launching a live streaming service, which I especially wanted to call out because uh, the event has historically been kind of tough to watch. Uh, sorry, not tough to watch. Difficult to f- uh, find a platform that is showing. <laughs> um, and it's too bad because it's such an epic kind of event. Isle of Man TT is such a famous race. and. Um, Can you give uh, us like the 60-second synopsis of what Isle of Man TT is? I know that you've been sure. there. I know okay. that you've witnessed it in person. For the uninitiated, uh, Isle of Man TT is a uh, a race that takes place on the Isle of Man, which is an island between uh, England and Ireland, and uh, it is a 37-mile circuit <clears throat> around this island on public roads that they close off, and then people go as fast as they can. They've been doing it since 1900-something, 1796, I don't know. They've been doing it for a long time. Um and uh, it is a very famous race, and it is quite a spectacle to see. You, if you're into motorcycles, you're probably familiar with the YouTube clips of people bailing around uh, Irish road racing, just you know, going as fast as they can on public roads. It's it's wild, um, and uh, the the coverage that the event gets in in um, uh, England and Europe and uh, is is quite good. Typically, they have a lot of knowledgeable announcers, and they have really good. Uh, coverage of it, but sometimes it's hard to find. So anyway, for 15 euros this year, you can stream everything, or I don't know everything. You can stream coverage from the island, and you can watch all the races, which I think is darn cool. Yeah, and and now you know, unlike you know where you would have to show up and take a ferry, you'd have to you know take a trip to England and then take a ferry to the island and hope that right. you can get a hotel room above a bar so you could drink and watch at the same time. Um, now you can just sit on your couch, tune into your living room, and enjoy it for uh, fifteen euros. Uh, was it fifteen euros for the whole for the for the whole race? Is that what it basically I is? So. I don't think it's like per month because the whole event's like two weeks or yeah. something like that. So I think yeah. it's just for the whole event. I'm, so I'm, roughly, I'm roughly 20, <laughs> 20, 25 bucks uh, <laughs> right. U.S. dollars if you want to tune in and watch, which is significantly cheaper than um, any going, of the above options. Going to England <laughs> and doing what he said before. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, and the event's usually in June. I actually don't have the dates off the top of my head. Maybe we can put them on screen or something. There Hopefully you go. We will rely on um, our producer, Chase, indeed, to put dates indeed. up on the screen. But I want to take us into, so again, I know this is going to be one of those hot-button topics for, for Zachary here, um, because he doesn't <laughs> like when we talk about electric bikes that haven't been proven, but Triumph has announced a completed TE1 electric motorcycle, which is a mm-hmm. final prototype that they are now in the testing phase of. So it looks like this is actually... A, a real bike, Zach. It looks like this is something where Triumph is ready uh, to get to the point where they might be releasing an electric motorcycle in the coming years. Sure. Whatever you say, Spur. Come on. Bring a little <laughs> bit of positivity no. to it. No, no. I, I will say... Um, it's, not know, like it's, a, some... it's not like it's a, a, a Kickstarter campaign where they're trying yeah. to get you to pay money for something that doesn't exist yet. 100%. And that's exactly what, you know, what I, that, that's my my positive spin on this, is that, you know, our, our ears... Uh, perked up when we heard about this i think because it's not sort of like you know 
Billy Bob's motorcycle company has an electric bike that's going to have 200 horsepower and, and 200 miles of range. And you're like, yeah, whatever. 961 you know. foot pounds of torque. Exactly. Like. Um, yeah, sort of, you know, uh, but, and this is a real, you know, and, and there's, there's some collaboration with the Williams F1 team, I believe, or is that right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I forget. Yep, anyway, yep. the point is, um, it is, it does, and it appears to be a working prototype that, that Triumph built. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I am cautiously optimistic as always. Let me say that. So, all the details on this are over on Common Tread. You can check out the article that yeah. Andy Greaser wrote that said Triumph completes TE1 electric motorcycle final prototype. Uh, but just a few objectives that Triumph announced for the TE1. Um, one was developing electric motorcycle capability. Uh, the other was uh, providing an input into Triumph's future in electric motorcycle offerings, uh, driving innovation capability and new intellectual property, and then enhancing the credibility and profile of the British industry and design, of just British industry and design in general, which I thought was pretty cool because what I will say... Patriotic. Very much so. Not mm. not to, you know, I mean, we, we... I don't want to go back. You mentioned 1790s earlier, and like in the 1790s, we were <laughs> waving a different kind of flag over here with how we felt about Britain. But in 2022, we're all for them. Go Brits. Uh, what I will say is that like the Triumph motorcycle in general over the past 20 years has been uh, 20 30 years actually at this point John Bloor you know revamping the Triumph brand has really done a lot to to kind of push forward what Britain is doing in in, in the the world of motorcycling manufacturing right because in the 80s when Triumph went out of business you know, mm-hmm. it kind of left like a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths as far as like how far they'd come along. And we actually talked about this in that episode with, with Patrick Garvin where we hinted at the fact that like, you know, British motorcycles in the 60s and 70s weren't that weren't that weren't much more reliable than what you saw, uh, you know, maybe that AMF era of Harley Davidson doing anywhere else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but now, like if you were to buy a Triumph motorcycle today. I would put it up against pretty much any brand out there from a reliability standpoint. I've owned, you know, two of the modern era Triumphs. One I still have with over 80,000 miles on it. And the other one I think I sold with like 25,000 20, 20, miles on or something like that in like three years. So like they're building awesome and capable motorcycles. So I think it's exciting to see this come to fruition. Yeah, I I, I would have to I would have to agree with you. They're, they're a so, modern motorcycle yeah. company. However, as you said... It doesn't matter how many electric motorcycles they give us; they're not getting their colonies back. No way. I <laughs> am. You're first. We're, yeah, you're not getting America back, baby. Moving right along. <laughs> um, uh, there was a, a story that sort of resurfaced um, uh, because there was a spy photo a while ago with um, a Kawasaki Ninja H2 SX with some cameras mounted to it, um, and then the story bubbled up. I think we. Um, you found an MCN or something like that um, about um, how Kawasaki filed patents for um, uh, a forward. Was it rear facing also or just a forward facing camera? I just saw the on... forward facing camera right, um, right. on a 2022 Ninja H2 SX. So, uh, which is just, just a quick call out because we've talked about radar on the show and. Um, and some of the capabilities that radar offers when mounted to a motorcycle, such as adaptive cruise control or blind spot warning, that kind of thing. Uh, there's also this technology is advancing with um, cameras as well. You can do similar stuff uh, with uh, a, a essentially a camera lens that can sense objects and um, judge where they are and that kind of thing. So it's kind of it's just an interesting little nugget of technology. We're not going to dive into exactly how it works because first of all, we're not smart enough, and second of all, we don't have time. So uh, we just wanted to call it out as a, as an interesting little tidbit and uh, something to keep an eye on as far as how how major manufacturers approach uh, these new safety features. Yeah, it's interesting because we've seen some folks in the aftermarket try and uh, introduce this technology that you could buy as an aftermarket product. But to my knowledge, this is the first time that we're seeing uh, a major motorcycle manufacturer use camera technology to integrate as far as blind spot warnings and adaptive crews and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what Kawasaki does with it. Indeed. Indeed. I think that uh, might wrap up the news there. Does it not, Spurge? I are, are, are think it's time that we move on to the the real shebang, which is getting the, the real Ari star Henning of the show. Here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, sorry to interrupt you, but I was just so excited. We, we, no, we, the, I mean, the, the, we'll get my we'll heart. Get the, my heart's a pounding, a pounding. <laughs> Uh, the real Ari Henning. Will you please stand up? There he is. 
Ari Henning, welcome back to High Side, Low Side, my friend. How are you today? Always nice to join you guys and talk about motorcycles. I'm doing well. <laughs> Just coming at you from the old uh, Revzilla West uh, shop manual slash daily writer set over there. That's right. The epicenter of Revzilla West content. Get a lot of use out of this space. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So we are talking about packing tips for motorcycle trips. Ari, we figured you'd be a great person to uh, to talk to this one about. I know that I've done some motorcycle trips. I know that Zach's done some motorcycle trips. But, but Ari, like, what's like you probably win as far as like the longest motorcycle trip out of the three of us, right? How long for was sure. your longest motorcycle trip? Uh, six months. But that was that was. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't. I had no intention of it being that long. I just kept finding more fun roads to ride. But yeah, it was six months and like twenty thousand miles from coast to coast. So yeah, that was. Uh, that was my baptism of fire. Actually, that's not true. My first trip was in high school. I rode from Massachusetts to Key West wearing Carhartt jeans and hiking boots and <laughs> a totally inappropriate jacket. But, you know, you got to learn the hard way sometimes. And what bike was that on? <laughs> that was on a Bandit 600. And that's the same Both. as the bike that you used on the, your long? Okay. Yep, yep. So, yeah, lots of road yeah. tripping. And I love loading a bike up and just kind of hitting the road for hundreds of miles at a time for a couple of days or, you know, weeks or months. So any of you Bandit 600 riders out there, if you've got questions about how to pack and take a trip, <laughs> this is your guy right here. You send him a question to HighSideLowSide at RevZilla.com. No, what uh, I'll say is I, I think it's up, up until like, I mean, honestly, I, I would say that for the majority of my adult career, the majority of vacations that I have taken have been motorcycle trips. So I'm with you 100% as, as far as like it's a fun way to, to get out and just kind of leave the world behind. That's how we blur the job. lines between work passion. and play. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, Spurge, have you ever taken any long trips, uh, say across the country, on say any bikes that you? Still I mean, own, say if we want to play that that uh, high side low side drinking game right away, I'm ready to go with my uh, cross country trips on a Triumph Bonneville. That's a very inappropriate motorcycle for a cross country trip. Yeah. Well, so if any, if any we... of you if any of you are listening, we're all drinking right now. <laughs> Um, um, as we as we often say, and we may reiterate during this podcast, the the best motorcycle for what you want to do is the one you have. By gosh, exactly right. If you can't be with um, the but one I, you but love, I think love the one like, you honestly, like I <laughs> I have had a great time on that on that bike, and I think so. I don't. I I mean, obviously, twenty. I think, Ari, you were saying twenty thousand miles was roughly how far you went in that six months. I was on the road for about three and a half, maybe four weeks, and I did about nine thousand miles. And wow. it was uh, it was definitely. You can do it, right? I think that's if, if if you take nothing else away from this episode of the podcast is that like whatever motorcycle you have, you can take a road trip on, that's and that's what great, we're that's what we're here to unpack. Advice, and I like yeah. to think that the work Zach and I have done on camera with CTXB and other shows is, has reinforced that. Like, whatever bike you've got is a perfectly <laughs> adequate bike for a rad adventure. Right. All you Trail One Twenty Five riders out there, if you're not riding right. to Alaska, <laughs> you're not doing it right. So uh, I would love to recap my majestic solo travel career, but uh, basically all the travel I've done on motorcycles has been documented on YouTube, so I don't really <laughs> need to go through any of that. And I, I don't hold a candle to the, either of these two gents when it comes to uh, a resume of, um, of motorcycle travel. But uh, I still feel at least prepared to talk about um, what we're going to talk about You've today. I think plenty the, of bags and covered yeah. lots of miles. <laughs> I have. I've washed plenty of underwear and plenty of sinks. Um, <laughs> so uh, on the topic of what to bring, uh, I think that's like the biggest place to start right here is, is sort of is, is talking about um, packing stuff on a bike, uh, what to bring, how to do it and uh, stuff like that. Um, so I think that uh, what we're going to try to do here is keep the, the nucleus of this conversation to, to sort of like a, a basic core of, what you need to do regardless of what type of bike you're on or what your destination may be. Um, and I, I'd like to kick it off with a, a pearl of Ari Henning wisdom, which is to lay out what you think you need to bring and then, what is it, cut it in half or like put some of the stuff away? Uh, What's the Reduce it by a half to a third. And I still fail <laughs> to do that. I still overpack and come home and unpack and there's shirts and socks that I never wore and pants that I never <laughs> wore. You, you don't need two pair of pants. You need one pair of pants. That's all you need. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, one well, pair of underwear, one pair of socks, one pair no, 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 of pants. No, no. That's the airy heading model. Socks. No, that's not true. This, you gotta, <laughs> this is awkward, guys, but I, I have to sign for a package for FedEx, so you just keep talking and I will be right back, I promise. Yeah, no this worries. is, this is almost as good as the time that uh, we had Ryan Fortnite on and the, the postal man was ringing the doorbell. So, well, well let's start off with this. So, um, with, your, with your bandit trip, did you have hard luggage for that? Did you have soft luggage? What did you, how did you pack 
uh, for that particular trip from a luggage standpoint? Well, I overpacked, as we have already discussed. It is a chronic problem for me. But yeah, I had Givi uh, hard luggage on the sides and the top. Um, and I, I do. Zach gave a pearl of wisdom that I have bestowed upon him. I will bestow upon the audience a pearl of wisdom that my dad bestowed upon me, which is that ultimately all you need to road trip is a toothbrush and a credit card. That is absolute minimalism. <laughs> you can buy what you need. I think a lot of people are concerned about packing everything they're going to need for the road trip with them when they leave. But like, you can buy stuff along the way. And if you forgot something, odds are, unless you're going, you know, deep into rural country, you can probably find what you forgot at a store. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take one quick aside, and you need to make sure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just piggyback on that. You need to make sure that the credit card that you take isn't expired. Uh, I <laughs> have made the mistake where I got to right around the Hoover Dam. I was living in Southern California, and I was on a road trip out to um, uh, the Grand Canyon for my first trip to the Grand Canyon. And I got just past Hoover Dam, and I went to get gas, and my card wasn't working. <laughs> and I had realized that I had gotten a new credit card in the mail, and I accidentally cut up the new credit card and threw that away, nice. and I put the expired credit card in my wallet. <laughs> that is okay. So, so yeah. yeah. You need it, the whole just bring a credit card. Make sure it's a it's a current credit card. Yep. So then I had about forty seven dollars in cash on me, and it was a lot of like just you know you, enough to get gas and like a few like candy bars at the uh, at the gas yep. station. That's yeah. terrific. Yep. That's that is a uh, that's, that's pack multiple very, credit cards. <laughs> right. Right. Like or most, you know like most Americans pack yeah. <laughs> pack the new one. That's a that's that's a good uh, that's a good nugget though. And I think also important to circle back on. Uh, I left for a trip one time, and and a friend dropped me off at an airport. Uh, this is not a motorcycle trip, but he said, "Did you did you forget anything?" And I said, "Probably." And he said, "Do you have a credit card?" And I said, "Yep." And he said, "Then you didn't forget anything. You'll be fine." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and especially when you're traveling on a motorcycle and everything is so compact and like you're trying to you're trying to you're not trying to <laughs> collect things in general. It's you're almost certainly going to save yourself with something yeah. like that. But but to so, get back to your your question, Spurgeon, about what luggage I used was was hard luggage, which I think is a good option, but obviously you can travel with just a backpack or a tailpack on your bike, or you can lash a duffel across the back seat with bungees. I mean, there's lots of ways to affix stuff to your motorcycle. Yeah, I think that there's some pros and cons, right? Like with the hard luggage, obviously, and we'll get into security a little bit later on in the episode, um, but you know, hard luggage can be locked and soft luggage can't. Um, I know when I did my trip on the, on the Bonnie, I had used soft luggage and it was, uh, I remember it, it was a, I still have it actually somewhere. Uh, it was a Cortec like three piece set. And like, there was like a duffel bag that actually like ratcheted like into to the, the connected. Yeah. Yep. But it was super simple. Um, it was, I think like 170 bucks for like the three piece kit. And it allowed me to have a little bit of extra storage. And then what I liked about it too, was that the duffel bag locked into the saddlebags, but then it had tie down points on the top. So yeah. with that particular trip, I was camping and then I could use straps to strap down like a sleeping pad and a tent to the top of the, of the luggage for extra room. So yeah, but lash that stuff on top is always useful. But saddle, soft saddle bags often come with rain covers, which are pretty effective. But that's another nice thing about hard luggage is it's going to be waterproof yep. as well. Yep. Oh, they they yep. are not effective. I will say for a fact. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, so the at least the, the, the ones that, side. that's the problem, right? So what yeah. what Ari is referring to is that a lot of these soft saddle bags will have these these uh, plastic covers that go over it, and they have like a elasticated cord. It's like that a shower you, cap. You, yes, exactly for the front <laughs> of the bag. But the problem is the back of the bag is typically what's sitting by your rear motorcycle tire as it's spinning up all the debris and splashy water. So hot tip for that scenario is to put all of the things that are going into your soft saddle bag into a durable plastic bag to keep them absolutely dry. There is what we're looking for, right? Those are the kind of hot (laughs) tips that you, the audience, are going to appreciate before you make the mistakes that we've made in our career. So what? um, here's a question to put to both of you. What's a... Uh, what's sort of your minimum and maximum for like acceptable uh, luggage option to to take a road trip? You know, like what what's the if, is there is there a, is there something that's too simple or too basic or not enough room that someone would have that you'd think like that's just not going to cut it? And and is there a, is there an upper echelon also where you're just like I that's just too much? Yeah, I, I think I think going what would draw the line for me in going to minimum is not bringing alternative footwear i've made that mistake mm, when you're like nice. oh i'll just wear my my cds or i'll just wear my riding shoes for this five day trip <laughs> and like they're not good for walking around a city they're not good for hiking a trail so any packing that would limit me from bringing even just like a really minimal pair of, of walking shoes would be would be too little but i've definitely done 
two, three, four day road trips with just a Kriga R20 backpack or just like a 15 or 20 liter tail pack. Um, so yeah, one change of clothes, the, the toiletries you need, uh, sunglasses, shoes, and that's pretty much a toolkit, obviously a plug kit, but yeah, you can go, you can go pretty minimal. Just think of, I think of it as back, um, like backpacking. Like if you're going on a hiking trip and backpacking, right. like what can you right. actually get away with for the overnights? Right. Yeah, and yeah. And that's go ahead, go ahead, Spurge. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that's kind of, the, that's kind of how motorcycle trips are compared to car trips, right? It's sort of like car camping yeah. versus backpack camping. You totally. know, you have to be super, to, if, you just have to be decisive and, and thoughtful about what you bring. And if you bring too much, um, you weigh your bike down and that's just not fun. And like, obviously that's less consequential if you're on a BMW RT, but if you're on a Tuono or a street triple and you put 70 pounds of luggage on your bike, it's totally going to change the way it behaves and how much fun it is to ride. So yep, packing true. light is also beneficial because you retain the performance from your motorcycle that you're hopefully going out there to enjoy. True. So, um, that brings up another point that I'd like to cover. Um, when you're putting stuff on your bike, the, the classic rule is to mount stuff between the axles, yeah. like try not to put stuff behind the rear axle or in front of the front axle, if that makes sense. So you don't want stuff dangling off and granted some, you know, uh, factory, you know, tail bags or, or luggage will be behind the rear axle and that's obviously acceptable. Um, but what other, what other things come to mind? Like, uh, uh, you know, where to, where to place heavy things, stuff like that. Well, yeah, so yeah, so back, I would say just backing up a second. So, cause this, this kind of ties in with your previous question and with this one. So like what I used to do with, uh, the VFR that I had was because that didn't have the factory luggage on it. It was a weird, like the fifth gen VFRs was weird as far as actually getting luggage for a sport. touring so bike. handsome. No, they look great, but they're not, they, <laughs> they weren't, there weren't really great luggage options that continued to carry through the, the positive looks. Um, so what I would do is I had a duffel bag and I would, to Aries point, I would ride most of my sport touring trips. Um, at the time I was living in Tennessee and I spent a lot of time in like mm. Eastern Tennessee and like Northern Georgia in that area. And I would go for like three stuff. to five days, yeah. but I could get away with like, I would wear a two piece, uh, like Revit leather, leather suit. And then you could take the jacket off and just walk around in the pants. Um, I would always take the duffel and it would be like a pair of sneakers on the bottom and mostly just underwear, socks, and I would always bring a camera. Like I think that was always one of the pieces of of gear before you could have a you know a cell phone camera <laughs> yeah. was to just always have a camera thrown in there. Um, but I would put the duffel on where the rear passenger would sit, and then I would just strap it down to the passenger peg. So to Zach's point, it would keep the luggage uh, a little bit more forward on the bike mm. to help distribute the weight. And then to Ari's point, like by keeping the weight down, I could still go have these great sport touring trips, have the luggage with me, but I wasn't affecting the performance uh, of the motorcycle. You just mm -hmm. have to be okay with like, you're going to wear the same outfit. I'm wearing the leather <laughs> pants for five no days in a row deal. and I'm just changing my underwear. Yeah. But I, I think the Zach's point, it's, it's like, if you're going to bring a toolkit that's going to weigh three pounds, then, and you've got saddlebags, you're going to want to put that as far forward and as low as possible. So basically, is if the more you can put things towards the center of mass of your motorcycle, the less it's gonna negatively impact the way the bike handles. And I'll also say that one of the things I guess I really enjoy about road trips on motorcycles is how you, and Zach, you talked about this when we went to Alaska, is how you, you learn where to put things for efficiency. Yes. And I'm always very diligent about using one saddlebag is for when I get to camp or when I get to hotel. So it's stuff I'm not gonna touch throughout the day. And then another saddlebag always on the top easily accessible is going to be rain gear if I'm not wearing something waterproof or layers. And then I yep. usually keep my food and tools somewhere separate, but basically compartmentalizing things. So you just know where to go to get what you need and you're not fumbling through or through layers of stuff to get things midway through the day, you know? So just having it like having it yep. in layers that makes sense for what you're going to want to access. And, and to a certain extent you have to learn that, right? Like you have yeah. to learn what you want and what you don't want. It's not like a, there's no like spreadsheet for that. that that's, that's universal. I do um, have a spreadsheet. Okay, well, fair enough. But I mean, <laughs> I have a point spreadsheet being... for for bike packing where I I basically because I chronically overpack, I color code things red, orange, and green. And if I use it, it's green. And if I only use it occasionally, it's orange. And if I never use it, it's red. And I just don't bring it next time. We need to yeah, get a yeah, copy of that spreadsheet so we can put it up on the screen for people to see the <laughs> the area heading packing spreadsheet. Well, what yeah, I want to say, uh, good. I I was just gonna say the to finish my point the the you should. Try to try to figure out what works for you and what doesn't, and that that's 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 really what's going to be most important is not sort of like what someone else tells you. You should. Have. I mean, r having rain gear at the top is a good universal thing to to keep in mind. Um, it's one of the things I really like about tank bags is uh, is that it's a great place to keep stuff that you want to access readily. Like, like and what, what do you put in your tank bag? Snacks for one, of course. Sunscreen, 
sunglasses, um, any any uh, you know paper maps from way back when, chapstick. I'm up, yes, I'm holding up chapstick. Ears holding up chapstick. It. Uh, it's often earplugs. like if you're if you're riding, uh, yeah, spare earplugs. If you're riding in a place that's um, uh, you know, it's sometimes hard to stay hydrated, which we'll cover later. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you, your lips get chappied. And yeah, those like little magnetic tank bag, if you have a metal tank, so, oh, so good. So brilliant. And they're so easy yeah. to pull off. I, I got honestly, a question, I, I was going to say, honestly, I, I think tank bags are probably one of the most underrated forms of luggage. Like if you pack correctly, you can get away with a, a lot in a tank yeah, bag. They're so useful. And most of them are expanding. Great. But I want to ask you guys, before we get off the topic of, of duffel bags on back seats, mm-hmm. what is your preferred method for securing said duffel bag? To passenger seat. Great question. I think uh, it's really hard to go wrong with a rock strap. Mm, they're I, so I, easily. I I will say MVP I did of go, motorcycling. I did yeah. go wrong with a rock strap somehow. <laughs> Those of you who watched the uh, CTXP Alaska episode will know <laughs> that I lost my luggage. You just um, didn't use enough rock straps. Right, or I didn't use it correctly. Or did whatever. you not tie it uh, down but, tightly? Did you not use all of your muscles and really ratchet that I'm down? I'm a cincher. If anything, I'm an over cincher. Spurge, how dare you? But I, uh, I, it did, it did get away from me. But the point is, rock straps. If you're not familiar, it's spelled R O K. Um, rock straps are really, really cool because they, they, they go through any sort of like little loop or section of a subframe. Um, it's a, and it's a, a flat, buckle of them. It's a flat bungee, a very strong flat bungee with a buckle, and then on either end of the bungee is nylon webbing with loops. So you can attach them to grab handles, you can attach them to passenger foot pegs, and then you can cinch it. And thanks to the elastic, you get you get steady tension on your load. And so I, I would say they are something you should pack as well. Like use them to, t- to tie your luggage down, but then extras. also throw an extra two in there. Cause like you'll probably find a use for like strapping something extra down when yep. you least expect it. Yep. Um, They're brilliant. Yeah. yeah. The one yep. thing I want to say is when we're thinking about weight, so, you know, kind of when we're wrapping up that weight conversation, I think it's important to note that, you know, Eric, you had mentioned hard luggage earlier. Just putting hard luggage on the motorcycle adds weight, you know. And so when we're talking about the handling of a motorcycle, a lot of people have gravitated towards top boxes, you know, Mm -hmm. especially as adventure motorcycling has become more popular as a touring option. Just putting an empty top box on the back end of a motorcycle changes the handling characteristics of how that front end wants to perform when you come on the throttle. So just practice going out and riding with the setup that you have with the weight in it. And, and again, keeping the heavy items out of that, that top box because it is yeah. going to really affect the performance of the bike. And don't forget to crank up the rear spring preload. Yeah. So again, little things that I've learned from doing them and not thinking about them ahead of time. Uh, you know, maybe you can learn from some of our mistakes that we've made over the years. But yeah, definitely the, when you start throwing luggage on a motorcycle, it does affect the handling. Any other, um, any other uh, nifty little hacks you guys have tripped over? You know, like the cut the toothbrush in half so it takes up less space by the travel sized. Well, let me ask you this: Zach. Deodorant. So uh, you've got know. Zach's got an entire you got an entire rack of gear behind you. So from like a riding, and I need ge- every piece of it. <laughs> from a riding gear perspective, like what's your go? to Like if you're going to take a mm-hmm. five to six day trip, like what's your go to outfit? Yeah, it's tough. We get real spoiled riding in California where you don't really have to worry about weather that's unfortunate. Truly inclement. <laughs> yeah, truly inclement, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, it depends. So five or six days on the road, what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to... I guess it would be riding riding pants and a, and a, and a jacket. Like I, I, I like probably a waterproof jacket and probably not waterproof pants, and I'd probably pack um, uh, pants like uh, some sort of uh, outer shell waterproof pants. Um, and then, and then, yeah, comfortable, comfortable boots that you're going to be in all the live long day. Um, I think the two piece, uh, a basic two piece of kit is the way to go. But an important thing to remember here also, just like the bike you have is the one you can use. The gear you have is probably okay too. If you supplement it, you know, like I think for a long time, the only jacket I had was a vented jacket. Um, like leather in the sleeves and mesh in the chest and back. Uh, it breathed really, really well. Uh, and I lived in San Francisco at the time, which anyone who's been there knows it's often cold. And frankly, the vented jacket, I rarely wore the vented jacket without a thermal layer underneath. But the nice thing about combining those things was that I would just wear what I was comfortable with and wear like a windstop thermal layer underneath. And I put the jacket over it and I'd be safe to ride. And if it was really warm, then I could just take it off and it would breathe. Um, and if it got cold, I'd put a rain slicker over it. So I just had a three-layer system that was good for any variety of 
wetness or dryness or coldness or heat. <laughs> yep. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, sort of like layering your, your, the, the wardrobe that you pack like that is a, is a super important thing to do for a road trip because you will, as, as any of us know, you can go on a one hour ride and be cold at the beginning and hot at the end. So if you're on a one week ride, there's no telling what's going to happen. What about you, Ari? Um, I, I follow a similar protocol to Zach. Like I'm a big fan of comfortable jeans and footwear and then like a really robust jacket that you can peel off. So you've got a little bit of freedom when you get off the bike. Um, I like one piece oversuits like the Aerostitch I'm fond of and, and other manufacturers that make something similar. Um, but yeah, the, the rain slicker, even if it's not motorcycle specific, or I guess if it is a motorcycle, just rain jacket, putting that over any jacket is going to make you so much warmer in cold conditions. So that's always yeah. a good thing to have. Even if you're riding across a desert and there's no anticipation of rain, it might be cold in the morning and evening. And at that point, having something that completely blocks the wind from getting to your torso helps so yeah. much. Yeah, we, we used that uh, a lot, even though we were not traveling quickly. Uh, when we did that trip across Alaska um, last summer, we yeah. we often employed that. We just put on our rain jacket, not because it was raining, but just to like be full wind stop. And it helps hold in some of the heat, which is super important. And yeah. Some, some life hacks. If you don't have a rain jacket and it's cold as you can put newspaper under your jacket, mm -hmm. the front of your jacket, my dad taught me that one. And then mm -hmm. again, with the, with the trash bags for the soft saddle bags, I like the really robust black plastic ones you get from like home Depot, but I always keep one of those folded up in my backpack as an emergency rain jacket, basically, because you can punch holes in the corners and pull it over your torso <laughs> and sit on it like a dress and it'll keep you more or less dry if it's pouring rain and you get caught out so just having those things to kind of save your bacon when when things don't go as planned and i think it's important to note and this gets back to the, like use what you have like you know obviously the three of us work for revzilla and we have access to like all this crazy gear but yet i still do a lot of those things because i i was on a trip uh, a couple of years back recent like within two years with my dad and he had packed rain gear and he had packed an outfit and i was like ah it's not gonna rain i'm fine um, and it rained a lot and I was very guilty of, of like the garbage bag trick over myself to try and keep warm and, and keep dry. So it's not pretty, but it works. Yeah. I would say that the one piece of gear, uh, to take with you, I like, I like the dedicated two piece suit as well. Um, like I said, I, I, I've spent years where the only outfit I had was that Revit, you know, two piece leather suit. I think two piece textile is obviously, you know, a lot of advantages there. And I like the, I like the, the dedicated riding stuff because you don't have to bring extra pants. Like, you know, you can kind of get away with like five days in that gear without it getting too funky as long as you're changing your, you know, the underbridges and stuff. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that uh, for me, if you're not getting into like high end, you know, integrated rain suits and everything like that, the one thing not to forget, because I've been guilty of this in the past, is like just an affordable, you know, over rain suit. And if you're out on a trip and you get caught in the rain, you can go to a Walmart and you can pick yep. up frog togs and yep. you can throw those over. Yep. Now, what I will yeah, say is the be, frog togs designed for motorcycles is different than the frog togs not designed for motorcycles, though. <laughs> Doesn't hold uh, up as well. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly some, some uh, outer layers designed for rain, uh, at speed, you, we, I think we've all seen that motorcyclist on the freeway with like the um, squinting the, into the, the rain. Well, the poncho on that's just getting shredded by the wind. <laughs> um, last thing I'll mention, uh, gear wise, is I almost always, I mean, yeah, even on like an afternoon ride, Ari knows this because he makes fun of me about it all the time, which is fair. I always bring two pairs of gloves, at least two pairs of gloves. Um, and I, I like that because I like having uh, like one one for one for cooler, one for warmer. Um, but also, just if one gets wet, then you just you always have a dry pair of gloves to put on. Um, if you if it if one gets soaked and then you just then you don't have time, like the other ones just don't dry, then you don't have to put wet gloves back on. You can at least have a have a backup pair, and they don't take up much room. I would say too the other thing that I like about that because I do the same thing. <clears throat> excuse me, not not in like an afternoon ride. I think that's ridiculous, but I love you anyway. Um, but I, but if I'm on a motorcycle trip, like I, I like having a big pair of waterproof or thermal gloves if it's a cold trip um, to keep your hands warm and dry. But the second it either gets warm or it gets dry, I want to go back to a regular pair of gloves with better tactile feel um, sure. because the big bulky gloves just wear your hands out after a while. Yep. yep. That's true, true enough. True enough. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think what, what we haven't covered. We're talk, we've covered... Um, uh, you know, luggage materials, where where to put the weight, how to pack some things, how to not bring too much stuff. Um, we have we have some other uh, topics that we want to dive into to do with uh, the road trip and how all this packing relates to the the subsequent journey. Um, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, Spurgeon, although today is my mistaken day, it's time to take a quick break for a sponsor from our ad. 
our, I, our, our Motul sponsor ad person. You are you you almost nailed that. It is in almost time. It, it is in fact time for a sponsorship ad. So let's uh, let's get to Motul, and we'll be right back with you, folks. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so we've got the luggage out of the way. We gave you a little bit of uh, you know some of the backstories behind the, the trips that we've all taken. But now let's get into the, the the trips themselves. So you've got the bike, you got luggage on it. Um, you know, we're going to talk first and foremost about lodging. And I, and I think oftentimes, you know, the biggest uh, question that I think comes up is like moto camping versus like mm. staying in a hotel on the road. And mm-hmm. as always, we're going to do guest honors here. Ari, do you have a <laughs> preference for uh, for either of those when you're out taking a trip? Well, freshly turned 37 sleeping on the ground does not feel quite as good as it used to um (laughs) there's so much romance to moto camping i mean it's just you know it's 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 such an aspiration and i have done plenty of it but boy howdy do i like get into a hotel and taking a hot shower and sleeping in a real bed these days so i guess depends how old how old you are it depends on how much experience you have doing the camping versus the hotel and also depends on uh you know what kind of budget you have because if you if you bandit camp then you're not paying anybody anything but you know even if you split a hotel room with someone, it's still probably gonna be 30 or 40 bucks. I was actually really surprised. Um, I was in California, my first road trip in California, how expensive campsites have gotten. Dude, um, it's like $30 and, I mean, that was, a night. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was. I remember doing a camping trip um, up just north of uh, San Luis Obispo, and I was, it was and like $35. You're lucky $35. if you can find a campsite. Yeah, well, that was the other true. thing too. They were all sold out, and I was like, I didn't, I didn't plan ahead. I mean, maybe that was part of the the, the tips and tricks that we can pass on to you uh, listeners Absolutely. out there. Is that like camping sites, especially in in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, they're hard to yep. find if you're not booking in advance. That's a that's a very important tip because nothing will ruin your day like trying to show up after a long day of riding and not having a place to pitch pitch your tent. Yeah, yeah. I, what what about you, Spurge? You you. Uh... Are you 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 on board with old man Aries uh, motel motif I've these had, days? I've had I've sure had I've had so <laughs> much fun moto camping. Like honestly, yeah. like I, I've done so many trips where um, the whole trip was just uh, very spur of the moment. You know, Ari mentioned bandit camping. Like I've I've been in some pretty bad situations <laughs> where I've woken up with people confronting me about sleeping on their property. Um, and I, yeah, and you I don't, don't sleep in the front yard, Spurgeon. Yeah. You gotta, like, I didn't be out see of the for sale sign. Sorry. Geez. No, I, I, I don't remember if I talked about this in a previous episode <laughs> or not, but I had, I was in, I was outside of Reno, Nevada and I had gone to a hotel that had, a there was a, like an RV park out back that kind of looked abandoned. And I had asked the, the woman at the desk, I was like, listen, I don't have money for a, a hotel room, but can I just, you know, put a tent up in the RV park? And she's like, sure, go ahead, like, have fun. So I went out and I set up the tent and the RV park had like a little, like, it was like a place to take a shower and like use an indoor bathroom. And I thought it was great. So I woke up in the morning and I, I go in and I showered and I came back out and I, I went in my tent to change. And a, and a guy pulled up and he was, he was, he was like a shotgun type thing. And he was just like, what are you doing on my land? And I was like, I asked the woman at the desk if I could use your, and sleep here. And she's like, he's like, that hotel isn't part of this. So the woman at you're the hotel, yeah, the woman she's at like, the hotel, yeah, like, do whatever you want. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't care what you're doing in the RV park. Cause it's not my property, um, is what she should have said. But she didn't. So I got I got chased out by a very angry individual uh, wow. uh, one yes. morning at sunrise. It's not good. Yeah. Well, I so, think I think obviously there's a it's a personal preference on where you're going to sleep. I do encourage everyone at some point to try moto camping, but if that is something you're going to do, you have to keep in mind that you're going to have to pack a lot more stuff. My wife often talks about wanting to go to at moto camping, and it's a real struggle to fit two people plus all your luggage plus camping equipment plus food because yeah. you know yeah. you got to have a stove and a camp pad and all that. And I know that's a separate conversation on what to bring in camping, sure. but it is. It is another large pack of stuff that you have to affix to your motorcycle. Yeah, and yep, we did that's... we did a video on that a while ago about like moto camping specifically. What I will say is like when I was talking earlier about like the VFR trip and like just getting away with the duffel bag and going for three or four days, you really can't do that if you're moto camping. Like if you're moto camping, you have to you have to really plan out what you're packing. Whereas if you are just taking a, a quick trip where you're staying in hotel rooms, and let's be honest, uh, there's some pretty cheap hotel rooms out there like uh, the type of hotel room where you put a clean t-shirt over the pillow because exactly yeah and those <laughs> are usually the hotel times. rooms that i'm staying at yeah. so yeah, oh, yeah it definitely depends on if i'm traveling solo or if i'm traveling with somebody that has slightly higher taste yeah well i'll just say that i i uh i have done a bit of two up moto camping and to aries point it like yeah my my girlfriend at the time now wife 
we were on a huge motorcycle with a ton of luggage and it was still packed to the brim and felt like we barely had it. Like we didn't change our clothes and we barely had enough room to bring everything. Um, so yeah, you can certainly do it. Um, you can do it pretty, uh, pretty Spartan style, but, but yeah, it is tricky. I think I I'm very pro hotel and, and I think that it's a great way to, to support the economy. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's also, I mean, it's a nice way to travel. North. Like, like Ari said, you know, like being able to take a shower at the end of the day, like you're still packing light. you still get to experience the, the trip on the motorcycle. And you yeah. know, you maybe you don't have the same independence you do if you have a tent on the back. But, um, but I, I will say that, you know, just, I think just like camping off a motorcycle, which as Ari said, we're not going to explain to you how to do that. Hopefully, <laughs> you'll figure it out um but I, I think that you do it for those those times that are that are kind of special because we, i have done some moto camping Ari and i had one uh we were filming an episode one time we had one particular night of camping on the california coast that was just sort of oh, like staggering magical. beautiful and warm and and just so pleasant and 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 amazing and and you sort of you, that's what you're reaching for i think when when you when you do those things is you you're looking for those really those those special times but if it's not the if it's not the right time you don't think it's the the moment or the or the the, the era in your life to have those explorations or to try to find those moments then there's nothing there's no shame in motel motorcycle trips as far as i'm concerned what i will no. say is that there are times where i remember um there was one ex- there was one time in Morro bay in california and then there was one time in virginia up on skyline drive where i literally like i i rolled into the camp after dark i put up the tent and i woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, like the view, the scenery, it was like, I, I had no yeah, idea. And like nice waking surprise. up and like opening your, your tent flap and like looking out, like it's hard to get that with a hotel room. And that That's there true. is something, I, I think that everyone should at least try it once. Yes, agreed. Um, Cause agreed. there is a, there's a, there is it's a romance doing. to it. Even yeah. if it's just an overnight, even if you're not riding very far to do it, just to test it out, you should experience it. But as far as people staying in motels or hotels uh-huh. uh one piece of advice that zach and i have often implemented is to try and get a room on the ground floor yes. makes for easier unpacking it means you can keep an eye on your bike and it means that if you need to if it is an especially cheap hotel in a scuzzy neighborhood you might even <laughs> want to push your motorcycle inside the room which i have done many times oh yeah that's a that's a <laughs> That's a technique we've used with small, cheap motorcycles we thought people were going to steal or very expensive motorcycles that we, we also thought people, thought people were going to steal. Gonna steal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's the downside uh, to, to getting a cheap hotel, though, is because they're not always in nice neighborhoods. Yeah, and motorcycles right. are vulnerable. True do you want to uh, use that as a segue to jump into the security section and bump that up? Or do you want to save security for a little bit later? Because I think sure. that's a great segue. Yeah. 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 Sure, and, sure. And we so, talked about... Rip. No, I was just gonna, I was going to ask you like aside from aside from pushing them into hotel rooms, do you, do you Ari or you Zach have anything that you like to you know do to make sure bikes are secure when you're on a trip? That's that's kind of the ultimate, right? <laughs> Push pushing I mean, it into the hotel room. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the the last ditch. Yeah, that keeps like, everything oh, safe. I mean, yeah, locking I, your steering if you're going to leave it outside. Uh, another benefit of hard luggage, as we talked about, is it's lockable. No one's going to cut into it with a pocket knife or a soft luggage. Someone can slash. Um, Bring in your stuff in. Like, don't be lazy. Don't be like, oh, I'm just going to, like, leave it on the bike tonight. It'll be fine. Like, you're going to be so bummed if someone, if an opportunist just, like, jacks the stuff off your bike. So bring it all inside. Don't leave your helmet on your bike when you go into cafes or into check into your hotel. Like, just keep your stuff yep. about you. One one thing I'd say is, uh, is you know, the, the, there's the, whether you, if you're at a, um, whether, I guess, whether it's a, frankly, a campsite or a, <laughs> or a hotel motel, um, you know, like well-lit areas that seem high traffic. That's a, that's like an obvious one. Another thing I would say is ask, uh, if you're at a hotel or motel, just ask if you can keep it yeah. in the, in the, can, the sort of area right yeah. in front of the lobby yeah, or whatever. The loading, unloading area. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes they're just like, oh sure, you can park there. Like I know it says fire lane, but don't worry about it. Um, they're, they're accommodating to motorcyclists sometimes, or you can park like up on a curb as long as it's out of the way. They yeah. understand that. God you're forbid there's a fire safe. in the hotel though. And that fire truck just runs right over <laughs> your motorcycle. Run over it. <laughs> well, you know, that would be fair. I suppose. And also they'll often know where the cameras are, like where the cameras are pointed. So mm-hmm. you can, you know, at, at very minimum, you can ask them that, like where are the cameras pointed? Cause I want to park there just for a little bit of added security. True enough. I think, I, I think a, the one I, I think the one it, thing you hit there too was from a luggage standpoint and taking stuff inside. Like keeping in mind that while hard luggage is great, you can lock it. 
it is a deterrent in itself. If someone steals that motorcycle and you've left all your luggage on the bike, <laughs> you've got nothing now. So at least like <laughs> if you've if somebody does steal the bike and you've got your luggage inside, um, you know, I would always recommend taking your <laughs> luggage in at night. Like if you're just running in to check in or you're running into the cafe, just lock your stuff up. You should be okay there. But if you're gonna sleep for the night, take everything off the bike. Don't give anyone a reason to start going and trying to open boxes. At yeah. least, at least, if they steal your bike, you'll have clean underwear and a toothbrush. In <laughs> yeah, that's just like you know when you fly, you always keep that in your carry-on. So if your checked yeah. luggage disappears, you're not totally screwed. Exactly, exactly. So what about other like? Have you guys ever packed like a an actual lock for a bike? I don't think I've ever done. Yeah, that. I did early yeah. on, and then I stopped because it's just so heavy and cumbersome to carry. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. it's it's just a reminder. Like your steering might be locked, but any two individuals with a truck or a van can just lift yeah. your steering locked motorcycle <laughs> and disappear yep. with it. They don't need to. They don't need to hotwire it. They don't need to break the steering. They can just take your whole motorcycle. So yeah. what I will say is, so just to explain to people that are listening that might not realize this, Ari has mentioned this twice now. So a steering lock is most, all, almost all motorcycles have a have a steering head stem lock where you turn the handlebar all the way to the left and then you turn the key all the way to the left. Or on some motorcycles, it's down on the, the steering head stem and there's a separate key for it and you use a separate key to lock it. It locks the handlebars all the way in the left position so that you can't easily push the bike around and move the handlebars where you want it to go. So that's what Ari is referring to. Um, I have started carrying with... Uh, started traveling with a disc lock, um, mm. and and there's a pro mm. and a con to this. The the pro is that I have one of the ones with the alarm in it, and it's on godly loud. So if yes. anybody even like bumps the motorcycle, it it sounds <laughs> off like a siren that you can hear in a hotel room three stories up if you had to. The downside is when that alarm malfunctions. <laughs> and it just goes off all day long in your saddlebag, Ugh. and there's no way to take it. You have to like take it apart to get the battery out because the whole point of the alarm is that you can't take the battery yeah, out you can't easily. Um, so I've I've been in that trip already where Ugh. you're rolling down the highway and there's no easy way to pull over and it's just like oh, eh, no. eh, eh, and you're like ah. Oh. Um, but yeah. So anyway, so anyway, Spurgeon threw his disc lock in a lake where it's <laughs> still disturbing fish to this day. Oh my uh, lord. That's, that's funny, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I've ever, I've definitely never traveled with a lock that I can remember, that was good enough to lock a bike to a solid object. But that is, uh, to 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 paraphrase Aries' point earlier, that is kind of the best way to to lock up a motorcycle, and it is a cumbersome way to try to travel with something like that. So yeah. it's a you're between a rock and a hard place to a certain extent um, with with security, I would say. Um, but that's where another, I think the, 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 the easy compromise and what I would recommend for people that are actually traveling is you guys are right. Like if I was to bring a cable with me and like a horseshoe lock and try to wrap it around a tree, like there's a lot there. But like <laughs> yeah. the modern the modern disc locks with the alarm in them, um, as long as you don't have one that malfunctions and goes off all day long, uh, they're, they're small. They're relatively lightweight. You can put them in the bottom of a saddlebag. You can easily pull them out and, and lock your bike up. And it's a it's a bare minimum security, especially if you're staying in those cheap hotels in the you know a shady part of you know town. Yeah, true, true. Well, it said you know the alarm going off is a good deterrent. It might still someone could pick up your bike and put it in the back of a truck, but if it makes a bunch of noise, that might scare them off. Right. So, um, uh, unless you guys have any last hacks to add to security, I I think it's high time we dove into a topic that I know Ari will have lots to say about, which is maintenance on the road and what tools to pack. Uh, yeah, sorry. I had one more thing I wanted to add to security. Sure. Do it. Um, like a little, a little, um, cable lock, like they sell at airports or you can make one yourself out of like 16th or 32nd inch stainless steel cable and some ferrules and then a tiny little padlock. And I'll use that. I keep that wound up. It's like six feet long and only weighs a couple ounces in my tank bag. And then when I get off to go do a hike or do something, you can run that cable through the sleeve of your jacket and through the chin bar of your helmet and mm. then through the triple clamp or through your frame. And like, it's not people have criticized me like, Oh, I could cut through that with my pocket knife or, Oh, you know, you could snip that. It's like, yes, absolutely. Every, every security device can be breached, but it's just, it keeps opportunists from just grabbing your stuff and walking away. And it's very small and compact. So that's yep. a, that's my last suggestion on the security front. I, yeah, so that, I, I like helmet locks too. I don't, not, not all motorcycles come with helmet locks these days, say, yeah. but I, I had one that I, you can get them where they just go right around the frame rail. Um, yeah. and a, hem, a helmet bucks. lock's a great addition. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 20 bucks for the, the cheap. They're easy. 
Except for the idiot thieves who will actually cut your chin strap in order to steal your helmet. <laughs> then they true, have an unusable helmet. So you know what? Fun. Jokes yeah. on them. <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous. Any true, case, true, true. Uh, moving on to what was it? Tools, tools and repairs and maintenance Ma- and such. I love maintenance on the about road and and yeah, what what tools to bring? So what would, what's your? I don't know. Is there a way to succinctly talk about what what tools you would recommend packing for for a for a motorcycle trip, Barry? Yeah, there's like this little six minute video we made on YouTube for the shop manual recently <laughs> about what toolkits to bring. That is my everyday toolkit, but. Um, yeah, to summarize that video, it's you, you should start with a quality aftermarket toolkit. I really like the tro- Cruise Tools Kits, but don't be satisfied thinking that it's going to have everything you need. Like, actually take it open, open it, apply it to your motorcycle, make sure it has the correct wrenches to adjust your controls, to tighten your mirrors, to like, you know, tighten foot pegs and stuff. Um, add to it, add, add some duct tape, add some electrical tape, add some zip ties, add some safety wire, add some random six and eight millimeter nuts and bolts spare fuses um yeah like i said you should probably watch the video <laughs> yeah that's a obviously obviously a very good resource but I, the one thing that i'll <laughs> i'll add to uh what Ari said that he's imparted on me over the years uh when packing a toolkit for a trip like this is just diligence and testing it out before you leave like you you know what bike you're taking on the trip you know uh, approximately what you're you what you might need to do and you're going to draw the line somewhere and say well if if I, you know, if I lunch a piston, I'm not going to be able to do that on the road. Yeah. And that's just that. So, but test, you know, just look at the bike, put the, put the tools on there and then make a pile of what you think you're going to need. That's the, the most obvious and best way to do it. And I think and the it, biggest thing for a road trip, and this is something that I know that we've all talked about. I know, Eric, you've hit on your videos. Um, but the number one malfunction that's going to ruin a road trip is going to be a flat tire. Right. So if you know how to repair a flat tire on a trip, you're at least going to be able to get home. Um, you might yeah. not want to push push it, you know, on you know extreme lean angles, but like know how to plug a tire if you have cast wheels, and if you've got tube type wheels, know how to put a tube in. Like it's not it's not something you want to learn and try for the first no, time. It's not, and you, you don't want to have to on call the side of the road. AAA and wait for half a day. Like it's just miserable. It's but so the, easily. But avoidable. the problem is if you, if you call AAA for a motorcycle, like and they don't have the specific tools you need to even take off. Like like no, some of these inverted the hexes. The they're gonna they're no. gonna take your bike to a shop and it's gonna be a multi day and expensive ordeal. So absolutely have a plug kit and most importantly know how to use it. Practice it before you hit the road. I've used my plug kit to help other people so many times in the road, and half the time they're like, I didn't even know you could plug a motorcycle tire. So we've yep. also got videos on that, and it's a just a super valuable skill to have, even if all you're doing is commuting three miles every day, like a flat tire could still ruin your morning. And one of the other, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, especially if you have tubeless tires, as Spurge said, Oh, it's so easy. It's so easy. Oh my God. It's so easy. And the kits are, are small and, and they're easy to use. It's just, it's so, so, so easy. (laughs) What I would say too, is when I first started taking motorcycle trips, because when I was on the Bonneville, the Bonneville used tubes and I would carry spare, a spare tube for the front and a spare tube for the rear. Well, what I've learned over the years is that like in a, in a pinch, no pun intended, um, <laughs> you can you can put a, a, a larger tube in a smaller wheel. So uh, that's an adventure bike that, trick, right? It's an, that's where I learned how to do it. But yeah. but it works on it works on street bikes too, um, for the most part. But you can basically get away with if I have a 21 inch front on on my adventure bike and I've got an 18 inch rear, I just carry a 21 inch tube. And even if I get a rear flat, I can still stuff a, a 21 inch tube in there and at least get back down the road. So. I carry one of the one of the mandatories in my toolkits is to have a spare tube. I know that you can carry patch kits and you can patch the tube and put it back together and yada yada yada. But uh, you know, for uh, the the small little real estate that a, a 21 inch tube takes up, I keep that in there and I keep a little thing of uh, Dawn dish soap uh, because mm. the Dawn dish soap helps when you have a, a bead that won't reset. Yep. yep. Um, well, Spurgeon, one is none, two is one. So you should really carry two <laughs> tubes or at least a patch kit with the tubes. <laughs> Yeah, but I think so. What other, what other, like, as far I, as like, a question. tips, that's what I say. Like, what other Zach's things could happen? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Ari, I know Zachary. that you're all about chain maintenance, and but my chain lube is in an aerosol can and it's big, and air, packing aerosol cans doesn't make any sense. But I want to lube my chain because I'm taking like a multi thousand mile trip. What do I do? You get one of the little travel size chain lubes. I think Motul's got a great little one that's actually you can refill, it's like two ounces. Or, and I'm sure you've seen me do this, you can pull an oil court out of the trash can at a gas station because there's always a little bit swirling around down there and you punch a hole in one corner and you use that to lubricate your chain because it works great. 
Um, so that's a that's always an option. I've lubricated many a chain with 5W30 out of some gas gas station trash can. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, I was say the other like I don't do as far as like WD40. Uh, most most gas stations have like a little can of WD40 hanging out somewhere in the back too. And like in a pinch, yep. I've definitely used WD40 to just you know clean off a chain, especially if you're riding all day in a rain storm. Uh, the yeah. next day, it's it's good to just you know give a little lube on that chain. That's a that's a great suggestion, honestly, because I know WD40 has those travel sizes, and everyone can rest easy knowing that WD40 will not damage the nitrile O-rings on your seal chain. It will help condition them and it'll dispel all the water that's in the link so yeah it's a great great suggestion spurge did you do a video on that or an article did a video a long time ago okay, okay. and uh yeah we did a bunch of testing and talked to a bunch of people and it's it's all good and i still use it regularly on my chains the repair and maintenance thing another thing to bring up is that your best bet for avoiding issues is to make sure your bike is dialed in before you leave so comprehensive tune-up comprehensive one once over stem to stern checking all the things just making sure the bike's in good shape. Don't assume it is. You know, check your tires, check your chain, check your brake pads, your fluid, all that stuff before you hit the road, and that'll just an ounce of prevention. You know what they say. So yeah. what I will say is one thing that I didn't expect to ruin a road trip once was a burned out taillight. And I uh -huh. was, uh, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon on the on the the South Rim, there's a long like 40 mile road that you have to take to get in, and I got pulled over because my taillight was burned out. And there was a Walmart 40 miles back in the other direction. And I said oh, to the guy, I was like, can I just ride down to the Walmart? And I got hit by a pretty, uh, uh, yeah, let's say he was an angry police officer. I caught him on the wrong day. And he was <laughs> like, you can absolutely not ride with this. He's like, if I catch you riding without this taillight, like I will pull you over and give you a ticket. The first one's a warning. If I catch you riding again, uh, second one's a ticket. So, so what, what are you supposed to suggestion? do? He asked me to pull over to the side of the road and camp. He saw that I had camping gear with me. Oh, was it was after like, dark? It was after dark. Ah, um, all right, that's fair. That is that's it was after dark. be riding without a tail. Well, I I told him I was like, can I at least can I just ride with my foot on the because it was yeah, a dual filament bulb? Can I just drag yeah. the rear brake until I get into town and I'll buy a new bulb? And he was like, nope. I asked him if he would follow me, and he was like, nope. So uh, in that particular instance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't want to get into that. But I, in that particular instance, a, a, a taillight bulb actually put me in a pretty in a pretty rough spot. Luckily, I had camping gear, and I was able to. I had a pretty good experience camping on this little fire road outside the Grand Canyon, and it made a good story that later ended up in a common trade article. But uh, check your check your bulbs too. Make sure your taillights are working, your headlights, your high beams, uh, turn signals, things like that. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's that very very good advice. So. Um, you, you, we pointed people toward the, the shop manual video on uh, everyday carry toolkit, which would be a great one to use on a camping trip. Uh, any other, any other hacks that pop to mind? I love the gas station oil, oil can chain lube trick. Um, any mm. other things that pop to mind to area or spurge? I mean, I always pack rope, a length of rope, like eight yeah. to 10 feet of like real thin, um, cord just for lashing things and making repairs as needed. Uh, not a great replacement necessarily for a rock strap, but it'll do in a pinch. Um, you do have to know how to tie some knots. I'd suggest a bowline and a half hitch. Those are always handy. Um, but yeah, I'm nothing, nothing springing to mind. Like if you've got a comprehensive toolkit and you've got a plug kit, like some people really like the jumper packs to pack one of those. Mm -hmm, you can use them mm -hmm. to keep your phone charged and stuff too. I don't know. Yep. I don't necessarily think it's, it's not something I usually pack, but, uh, people, yep. people seem to like them. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's a, they are fairly compact. You can jumpstart your bike if you if you accidentally kill the battery, you can charge the pack as you ride. If you can plug it into your bike yep. uh, during the trip and you can keep your phone charged with it. So it's, you know, it's certainly useful. Um, it is uh, as Ari suggests, a, a bit of a luxury, but, uh, but something to keep in mind and that there are lots of options in that vein these days, which is a, which is good news. Yeah. The, uh, I'll bring up that there seems to be this conception, this misconception that like when you leave your zip code, you're somehow, more prone to mechanical failure. I think there's an inherent fear that a lot of people have, and I know I was subject to it as well when I was younger, that like being far from home, you feel vulnerable. Like you're away from people that can help you, you're away from the familiar, but doing a thousand mile or a 5,000 mile road trip is just like taking a 500 mile day ride day after day. It's not, you know, you don't, <laughs> statistically speaking, Murphy's Law be damned, you're not any more likely to have issues just because you're out on the road. Um, so like, don't, don't let that inhibit you from wanting to travel because it's definitely worth it in terms of the experiences you're going to gather. The one thing yeah. that I will say that I, I start, this started out as like a, a tip for my dad and it's probably not, um, it's probably not as, uh, useful with modern, uh, cables, but I, 
for the longest time, and I still do if I'm if I'm on the Bonnie, I have a spare uh, cable for the cable clutch with me at all times. Um, mm-hmm. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, and I've also I've also done it on the adventure bikes where I've broken off a clutch lever, uh, mm-hmm. which I didn't have a spare one with me, and and that was a real hoot and a half. Um, <laughs> but I think for the longest time, like a lot of people don't realize that you you should be maintaining your cables on your motorcycle. You should be lubing and and hide and you know making sure that all of your your cables are actuating correctly either throttle cables or clutch cables and especially with a clutch cable i would always carry a, a spare because usually if you're changing your clutch cables every thirty thousand miles or so um you can just keep the old one stick yeah. in the tank bag and it's a good it's a good second to have and it doesn't take yeah, up a lot of room smart. they do that yeah. is a that is a wear item it's consumable yeah. i like that um well uh feel free to circle back to um to to maintenance and and tools and that kind of thing if you something pops into your tiny minds fellas but i'd like to turn to (laughs) another topic that i know is near and dear to both of your hearts and that is food um like what to like how like what to eat when you're traveling that kind of thing um and there i think that there's like there's there's some basics like a camelback backpack i love like i love mm, having yep. water on my back i think that's a great way to do it because it's hard to stay it's hydrated a, when you're riding yeah, you sometimes. can drink when you when you're thirsty as opposed to having to wait until you pull over which is exactly is, you're just gonna end up dehydrated if you do that so i think a hydration pack is brilliant yeah I, and you can you, fish you, it under your under your chin bar and actually drink while you ride it's wonderful yeah it's fabulous um and combine it with a texas catheter and you basically that's the one downside to Staying well hydrated on a motorcycle is you got to take you got to take bathroom breaks, you know. But yep. as Zach and I found when we rode across Texas, um, you know, <laughs> there are travel catheters that work great. You just run down your pant leg and just true, leave true. it on the highway. Absolutely not. One, Listen, pull one, over. Absolutely God, not. That is, <laughs> dude, don't knock it till you try it. I'm Stop. serious. Oh my God. No, it's, no. It, it was, takes it a lot great. of getting used to, but then like I don't I don't know if I'm gonna road trip with that one. <laughs> so I don't want a road trip with you. One one. No, you don't want to be behind me when I use yeah, it. Exactly. I'll let you know. <laughs> I can speak to that. Um, so uh, the 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 camelback backpack thing is great for all the reasons you'd expect. Same reason it's great when you when you go on a hike. You just sort of like walk along and you just wear the water and you can drink it while you move and it's awesome. And it's and brilliant for if you're camping because then you've got water and you can actually like pour it into bowls and whatnot. Yeah. It's so good. Um, there's a lot I, of mo- there's a lot a- of modern jackets that have the pockets in it too. So you can actually sure, there's sure. Certain, like certain jackets that actually just have a little pocket that you can put it right in the jacket itself. So I was on a road trip. Uh, a number of years ago, I rode a BMW 850 GS Adventure from Utah back to California. It took two or three days to do it. And I happened to be riding through um, Nevada during one of the hottest days of the year. And the bike was showing 119 degrees and uh, of ambient air temp. And I I found that I, I wish I had a Camelback on, not – I mean, like, I wanted to keep hydrating, obviously. But I literally – like, the time it took to stop and drink water – I would sweat so much and it was so hot and, and the, the, the environment was just sucking so much energy and moisture out of me that the, 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 just the five minutes I would pull over and I would just chug a liter of water and I'd put the empty bottle back in the saddlebag and I'd get on the bike and start going again. And just that pause was like, felt like it Agonizing. was taxing on me, you know? Um, so even if it's a lesser extreme, um, yeah, we just can't recommend those things. The uh, one, the one enough. thing I will note, and, and this is something that I learned from the ADV world, um, is that I like using hydration tablets in in the in my mm-hmm. camel pack, or I, I use a I use a Usui pack, which I really like because there's like elastic in there and it kind of moves with me on the motorcycle. Um, but I'll use I'll use like noon tablets and I'll just mm-hmm. drop two or three of those in, and it actually helps to keep you hydrated much more than just regular water does. And when you're cleaning a hydration pack, you, like if you go to like REI and you buy like the twelve cleaning tablets for like a lot of money, you can actually use uh, <laughs> Effordent Denture Cleaner. You can go to CVS and buy like the the bulk pack of like Effordent tablets. <laughs> For oh, like yeah? six dollars for like a hundred and fifty of them. Um, so if we go visit your house, you're gonna have that in the medicine cabinet <laughs> so or something. It's the I've first, never heard this. The Neither first I, time this is a tip. The, my my the first time that my girlfriend was like we were like making dinner the one night together early in our dating career, and uh, she was like, Do you have dentures? And I was like, No. She's like, right. she's like, you. It's okay if you do. Did like, you, you used can to tell date me. a senior citizen, <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I don't have dentures. And she's like, all right, but and then she pulls out this, like she like was hiding, like she found it and she like thought the she was like catching it. Yeah, and she's oh, like, why do you have this tablets. giant thing of like denture cleaner? Right. Um, and I was like, you, oh, I, she gave you the aha. <laughs> she was like, I caught you with your fake teeth. <laughs> yeah, but no, I use, uh, I use, and it's it's so much more affordable to clean out your hydration packs with the uh, with the effort. I didn't fun, really know fun about fact. the cleaning out the hydration pack 
dip in general. <laughs> I usually just rinse it with water, but I don't put anything but water in it. I know if you put oh, like noon or something with sugar or anything like that, it'll get funky. But even yep, if you, yep. even if you're just using water, if you let the if you if you let the water sit in your pack and you don't completely drain nope. it out, you can cause you can cause nope. problems there. I live, in, I live in the greater Los Angeles area. We've got like seven percent chlorine in our water, so it's it's golden. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh uh, Ari, I know you, you've uh, regaled me with tales of what you ate on your long, you know, your, your journey of tens of thousands of miles. Um, what did you, what did you find uh, uh, along the long, lonely road that you can impart on, on people about what are good things to pack? Yep. When you, when you are a, a youngin and you don't have a lot of money and you're not going to be able to afford eating in restaurants and you don't particularly like fast food, I would recommend packing hard salami, sharp cheddar, apples, and a jar of peanut butter. I ate a lot of mm. that stuff. But it works great because it doesn't necessarily need to be refrigerated. Um, holds up well without refrigeration. Is obviously very calorie dense and uh, flavorful. And and then the other tip is if it's not, if it doesn't sound good because you've been eating it for days already, just wait longer because hunger is the best seasoning. So it will eventually start to seem really appealing if you get hungry enough. And uh, yep. yeah, probably probably not the not the most enjoyable way to to feed your body on a road trip. But um, yeah, you can do that. And obviously, like. Uh, Instant coffee for those of us who like to drink coffee, and instant oatmeal works really well for breakfast. Ari Henning drinks instant coffee. The coffee connoisseur himself is recommending to people to drink instant <laughs> coffee. I'm I figured you'd be like, bring a here. jet boil along, bring a <laughs> pour bring over a glass, boil. and then he like does. make your own he artisanal a, a bean travel. grinder. <laughs> yeah, I, I nowadays as as a as an older man with uh, more refined tastes, I will I will stoop to the level of bringing pre ground beans with me. But I do bring a jet boil or French press, and uh, yeah, uh, Zach seen me brew plenty of coffee out in the wilderness. Show have we 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 fended off hordes of mosquitoes as uh, as we ate lunch, and Ari made a f- fresh pot of French press uh, out out on the Alaskan tundra. Um, yeah. And I, I think that there, there's, this is another thing where, uh, I don't think it's, we're not going to give you a recipe for exactly what you should bring. There's tons and tons of non-perishable things that you can pack in your, in your bags, but it's a good idea to, to, to be more diligent about what you're, um, what you bring. Like Ari said, bring stuff that's, that's, um, that's calorie rich and, and, and that's will, durable. Like if you yeah, bring exactly. a bag of potato chips and then put it in your saddlebag, it's just going to be <laughs> potato powder when you open it later. Yeah. I, yeah I'm a big fan of the things that go ahead. No, go ahead, Ari. Uh, I was just reminded that um, Zach and I, when we traveled in Alaska, we had these like really hearty cookies or not cookies, crackers you can get like whole wheat crackers. And then we had the the squeezable peanut butter and then the jar of honey. And that was such a good snack. So you put the peanut butter on the cracker and the honey and it's like, it's so delicious. And it works as, it works as a snack. It works as dessert after dinner. And just so, just so we're clear, the insider information on that trip was, you know, Zach had to share his food with you, Ari, because you didn't bring enough. Yeah, and and the behind the scenes factoid there is the decision to not bring enough food for the trip was decided after we had left the store where we would buy enough food for the trip. So mm. <laughs> part of the reason I was angry is that I was not allowed to be prepared, which was both frustrating and a little embarrassing because. But I like Zach to be prepared. was prepared. You, you well, I yeah, I, I I had my my luggage. We were was supposed a to bigger. get food in Coldfoot. We were supposed to be allowed to buy food in Coldfoot, and so that's how much food I brought. Because why bring extra food? <laughs> You bring up you bring up a store a store subject. I know. I was I was I'm just poking the angry Alaskan bear. Um, so one of the things that I what, like to yeah, bring up. Yeah, what about for, you, Spurge? You, you have a weight in and you love food. I know this. I do. Slim Jims um, and Smarties, I can see it. No, I love um, and this goes back to like when when Lemmy and I would take trips together. Um, I love shelled peanuts. They're not necessarily the most convenient thing to pack, but if you're moto camping, not for like hotel staying, but like moto camping, I love sitting around like a campfire at the end of the day and just eating a bag of shelled peanuts. Um, sure. And that's not necessarily a tip. It's just something that's fun because you can share them with something people. That you and enjoy. It's like, yeah, it's something I enjoy. Um, it's an I, I'm a big fan of. I know that you had mentioned like the negatives of fast food, um, but one oh, of I my know favorite. Your Big Macs. I I like <laughs> McDonald's breakfast. No, that that was like that was that's just like calorie a, rich. Yeah, that's calorie rich. No, but like <laughs> McDonald's breakfast. Even if you're just going in for a cup of coffee, and maybe this is more for like those of you taking solo motorcycle trips. Uh, you can always show up at like 6 a.m. at a McDonald's and there's a bunch of old people hanging out. And there's someone to talk Virgin to. Virgin loves old people. I like their the when conversations are the amazing. I met a I met a guy in uh, uh oh, crap, where was it? It was in the middle of it was on it was on the loneliest road in America, which is high route highway fifty Colorado in Nevada. No, it was in Nevada. Nevada. 
Yeah. And I met a guy named Clyde. I remember him to this day. And he was on a he was on a Honda Shadow or a Honda Magna. Saber? What's the, was it a Saber? What's the V sixty five? What what's was the, the Magna? V, the Magna from the eighties. Yeah, before. Yep. He talked to me for like thirty minutes, and I had been alone on the road for like four days at that point. Like it was a great conversation. <laughs> he told Clyde me all about his grandkids. Friend. It was great. This um, is this is a this is a fun little uh, window into uh, you know tips for motorcycle trips where you're like sometimes you just need someone to talk, talk to. to. Yeah, you get lonely. I've, yeah, I will say um, I will say another fun fact about McDonald's is they always have Wi-Fi, and that goes uh, and international as well. My uh, and bathrooms. My my wife backpacked around the world, and um, one of her hot tips for international travels is uh, is McDonald's. You can always find Wi-Fi at McDonald's. So if you need That's to load a, a map tip. or yeah. whatever, so yep, you know. And but, uh, but the potato cookies are delicious. I agree with you, Spurge. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I, I do I do I do enjoy I do enjoy. Uh, breakfast on the road so even if i'm even if i'm eating <laughs> snacks for lunch um or just like a quick gas station stop i typically don't stop for lunch i'll just grab something and keep yeah. riding um and even if i'm camping i'll try to eat something around the campfire or from a hotel mm-hmm. it might just be a quick grab and grow but like i always try to have breakfast at either a mcdonald's or a diner or somewhere where i can be a little bit more relaxed because <laughs> oftentimes that's people. when i'm planning what'd you say and you can meet people exactly <laughs> You meet, the ni- you meet the nicest people on a motorcycle trip. Um, but I think uh, also because, like, typically in the mornings, like, you're planning out your route for the day. Like, I don't always go into a trip where, like, every day is planned out. So I like to take the morning yep. time to like, look at the maps and try to figure out where I'm going to go for the day. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, a couple more things I wanted to add. One, as far as packing snacks, which is how Ari and I often survive on road trips is, like, a, a, a plethora of snacks, is if you're not the type of person to – and I, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, throw shade in your direction. But if you're not the type of person who's normally in and around the sort of camping, hiking community, look outside the places where you might normally. Um, like if you go to an outdoor store, like an REI or something like that, they're going to have a bunch of stuff. You know, food that's good for for packing and traveling and good taking for with centuries. You because yeah, <laughs> and it's stride. They're they're you know the, look look in the areas of uh, uh, look in communities where you'll find the kind of uh, the, the kind of you know food and snacks that you'd be after, even if that's not where you normally shop or for food, and that's just not go to Seven Eleven and buy Top Ramen. <laughs> that's right. We well, actually sell. Say, we actually sell on Revzilla because, like, I would. I would top buy top Ramen? No, no, no. Uh, like oh. freeze dry. <laughs> oh yeah, we. we <laughs> you guys are both so excited. Like, <laughs> I, mean, I love Top Ramen. <laughs> I can get a discount on Top Ramen. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can get the discount on the freeze dried camping. It's like seventy nine cents a package <laughs> yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh my it's lord! It's got MSGs no. in it. Those make me crazy. Yeah, but I do the freeze the freeze dried camping food. Uh, even for we would use it for like dirt bike events for like the endurance yeah. races and stuff. Yeah. It's super. It's super. The first CTX episode we did the cheapskate cheapskate escape. We we ordered stuff from the old uh, mothership. Yeah, yeah, we did, and and we we were out. That was like mid pandemic, mid COVID nineteen pandemic, or the first surge, and we were out there for a while yeah, with nothing. That was, that was a hard episode to figure out. Oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to add on snack activities before we move away. One of my favorites, and it'll be a segue into another topic that I know we intend to discuss. <laughs> I really, I'm a caffeine fiend. I love uh, chocolate covered espresso beans in my jacket pocket for when I get sleepy. You nice. can just pop those in, and it's like they're delicious, and they give you a little, mm-hmm. little bit of that energy. Um, so that's something yeah. I like, but generally speaking, I know a lot of people lean away from caffeine on road trips um, for various reasons that we can now discuss. Well, I, I just think yeah. it's great that that serves because you get hangry if you're hungry. So like you that that feeds your appetite and it keeps you awake. So that's, that's, right. a, that's we, a great tip for for non uh, caffeine users. Um, uh, Ari and I also Call discovered me a user. <laughs> we I also quit discovered any day, Zach. Right, yeah, no, I know you can quit whenever you want, and it's fine. And uh, I I support you. Um, we discovered. Uh, Sour candy. We we had warheads and oh, yeah. one other one. I forget. We got we a tip. That. We we've pulled that tip off of a, um like a forum about iron butt riders. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But some sort of sour candy. You know, if you're uh, nice thing to have, another thing you have in your tank bag or your jacket pocket or something like that. If you have like 40 miles to go and and uh, obviously we don't condone um uh, riding while sleepy, but um you know something to keep you snappy and keep you awake is uh, uh sour candy there. We also don't condone methamphetamine use too. So like the sour candy is a good compromise for like the middle the middle of the road. And you can always <laughs> get the no-dos at the gas station, but I don't think you want to mess with that stuff. <laughs> so what, what what's the enough. reason so walk us through for those of us listening why why not uh caffeine? Like what's the downside for caffeine when you're on a motorcycle trip? Mm, good the question. Downside is caffeine's a diuretic, so it will actually serve to dehydrate you. Um I think I don't really know the the physics or the physiology of it, but 
primarily from my own experience, it seems to dehydrate <laughs> you by making you need to pee a lot. So those are not good things. If you're dehydrated, you're more prone to fatigue, headaches, all that stuff. It's obviously not good for you. And if you're stopping to take a leak all the time or showering the road with your Texas catheter, um, it's not, it's not always good for the pace. If you've got to pull over to pee a lot. I just, I think that what I've learned over the years is that, you know, I think in my younger days I would rely on caffeine and to your point, uh, I found now just drinking a lot of water, Gatorade, hydrating, you know, hydrating myself. I actually tend to be more alert and more awake without needing caffeine. So I think that gets back to our original point of like keeping the camel pack or the U sweet pack on your back and and just making sure that you're hydrating regularly. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. So Ari just offered a great segue to a topic that I forgot already. What was it? What did you segue to? Uh, uh, I, I don't remember. I was talking about caffeine. Yeah, and then you said like, and then and then you said like we could putting talk down about, miles, talking long long doing? distance, like can land. Can like, we re- can we can we rewind? I mean, we are recording. We can't we can't ro- we can't roll back the this tape. This is live. But, uh, maybe we'll remember. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think we we did have a couple other little um, miscellaneous things we wanted to uh, touch on that we had under the heading of putting down miles. Uh, very, very broad. Um, but uh, like a, like a, one of the things was a, a throttle, throttle assist. Like a, Oh, that's a great a point. Yeah. Like cruise, a, a mechanical throttle lock. Buddy. Those are super handy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You have, uh, I forget that one you had for years, but you liked it, right? Yeah. I don't remember what the name of it is either. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, there's a bunch of different variations of it, but it basically clamps on your throttle tube and you can roll your throttle open and then you use your index finger to push it down against the, the lever and it holds the throttle open and it's just super handy so that you can just relax your right arm a little bit and, and cruise along and get those, uh, those screaming sour warheads out of your tank bag. <laughs> what I will say too is that for those of you that don't have the budget for a, a throttle lock, uh, I've and I don't necessarily recommend this. So this is something that I've done, uh, but this is more of like a don't do what I say, just listen to it for entertainment purposes. Um, <laughs> for but entertainment I've, purposes only. I've uh, I've used like so with the Bonneville specifically. Um, there's you know it's a dual. Uh, there's two throttle cables, right? So there's a push pull throttle cable that opens up the carburetors, and if you adjust one of the the cables really aggressively, you can pull the throttle back and it just stays open. Um, now you have to remember that if you want to uh, tear that off, you have to like, manually really, push it back. That is a really bad idea. But, uh, a terrible, yeah. terrible idea. Yeah. Don't but you do can, that. You everyone can, listening, you can do it. Uh, no, everyone listening, <laughs> don't do that. A better option is to just get a rubber band and wrap it between the throttle grip and the switch housing and it adds friction so the, the throttle will stay put. I don't know what sort of crazy suicidal sorcerer you're talking about version. <laughs> you sounds... don't you don't you don't do it where it, 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 it you can still roll it back but it just makes it a little bit stiffer so it'll hold the throttle open and then you just roll it you roll it back down I'm i actually, think it's yeah, i don't know how that would work i think it's interesting uh that um you know some people we we uh i've heard criticisms of these you know any kind of throttle lock or or even the sort of like wackadoodle uh, technique that uh Ari just suggested where you put a rubber band between the the right grip and the you know the the inside of the um handlebar housing there so that it kind of jams um which is sort of what people say like oh my god that's crazy like i can't believe it you know like sticking the throttle open is some dangerous thing you do it's wild bikes used to come standard with this yeah. uh, with this option you could there was a little thumb screw on the bottom of the th- on the throttle tube and you could does that bike have it yeah Aries pointing to a BMW R1200 RT that we just picked up for a CTXP episode, and I thought it was too new to have that, but... It's also a special RT that has a P at the end of its name because it's used for law enforcement officers, so it has a throttle lock so that they can do other things with their hands. Little uh, little hint for what the next yeah, we got a, we got a little episode, right? little episode yeah, coming little up. It's gonna, um, gonna be fun. But anyway, bikes used to come with that as a as an option. Like you could spin the little thumb screw in and, and pinch the throttle so that it was harder yeah. to close, so you could relieve your wrist. And and at some point, as you know, as soon as electronic um, uh, cruise control came along, people were sort of like, "That's the only way to go." Which, to be clear, that's the best way to do it. But well, um, to be clear, what I'm talking about doing this, I'm not talking. No, about no, doing you're this. crazy. And you're I'm not talking about. It. But I don't think whether you're sticking a rubber band, adjusting throttle cables, or I using don't a throttle lock. How, how tightening the throttle cable? <laughs> all the, the adjustments on the throttle cable housing do is change the tension, the slack on the cable. So you, what, as far as I can tell, what you are describing would simply raise your idle. It would hold the throttle open, and you would not be able to close it all the way. You hold the th- it holds the throttle it just it holds the throttle open yes and then you, did just, you but, just, but you can but, roll it but you can roll it back but down. But the throttle excuse me the <laughs> throttle tube itself will stay put or yes. Hmm. I'll show yeah, well, I'll, did, I'll, I'll show you, you sometime but yeah. You sure you, did, you just did like dump sand down your throttle no, cable. No you just you adjust like you adjust the the return one where when you pull it open it just either you either slack out the top one where it doesn't pull it back or 
Yeah, you just you just. It's anyway. a push pull throttle. You're talking. It's about? a push pull yeah. throttle. Yeah. Okay. I, I see. Yeah. I'm, but anyway, my I'm point is, is that like whether you, whether you're messing around with that or you're putting a rubber <laughs> band on your throttle or you're using a throttle lock, we're talking about doing this when you're cruising down an open road. This isn't something you would engage while you're rolling through traffic. This is a way that if you're covering long miles in a day, you can give your right hand a bit of a break uh, while you're securely holding onto the handlebar with your left hand. Like, I think that's the key with this too. Like a lot of people have said, oh, you're crazy for doing this or, oh, like you should never lock your <laughs> yeah. throttle on or electronic cruise control even can be dangerous. <laughs> like we've had people write in saying that if you take your hand off your handlebar, you're a madman. So like, yeah, I just yeah. want to say like, there's some safety prerequisites that go along with like understanding when the right time to do this is and, and that there are some downsides to the implication. Fair enough. Very, right. very fair. Yeah. Well balanced. Good yeah. explanation. I think I think you covered our asses. Um, we <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's my yeah, lawyer message of the day. We're coming to the end of the podcast here, so we should say that none of what we said has any bearing on reality and should <laughs> not be taken for seriously under any purposes only. Exactly. Yeah. Um so yeah, but I think I think we've 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 hit on all the all the big stuff here, guys. Any any other things that percolate into the top of your heads here to, to run pa- through? Passenger pegs make a great option for stretching oh, yeah, out your yeah. legs. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. It, you can you don't need highway pegs in front of you if you have a broom handle. Like I've already done, like the the cut off <laughs> broom handle through the frame rail to like give you yeah. something to put your legs out in front of, and I've Highly used the passenger pegs solution. out back. Um, <laughs> What else? Uh, the only other thing I thought was like route planning. We talked about route planning. The one thing that I wanted to mention, um, you know, when I'm sitting out at McDonald's and I'm planning out my route for the day. <laughs> talking uh, to Clyde. Talking, talking to Clyde. Clyde, Clyde where are the good roads? <laughs> I like Butler maps. And, you know, Ari had mentioned the other day that, you know, we, we talked about Rever. Um, Rever has the Butler map integration. But even if you're just using the old fashioned, you know, fold out paper Butler maps, what I like about this is you can get them for different areas of the country and they've got routes in like yellow, orange, and red. And you can pick like, do you want scenic? Do you want like mildly curvy? Or do you want like fun sport bike, sport touring roads? Then they, they've also started to integrate options for like dirt roads for like adventure riders. So nice. I think that from a route planning perspective, I still like sitting down and physically planning out the mm-hmm. route. I like the whole idea of laying a map out in front of me. Recently, yeah. I've started using Rever for the desktop version to like plan out the route, yep. and then it uploads right to my phone. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think the Butler integration and Butler maps in general are a phenomenal resource for planning uh, a mm-hmm. motorcycle trip. Do you guys have any like go-tos that you use for planning out a trip? Uh, I found this... There's a little startup out of Silicon Valley called Google, and they have a map function. <laughs> How do you um, spell that? Name is Ever, uh, it's G O O G L E. I'll have to uh, look that up. Thanks. Yeah, Where'd you yeah. hear about them? Um, oh, I. He knows some, people in fringe. Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, you, He's got family up there. I listen to info. bands you've never even heard of. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah. Jokes aside, Google Maps is, is a good one. I and in the interest of full disclosure. Rever is a corporate partner. Yeah, yeah. Um, Google is ours. not. And, and Google <laughs> is not. No, definitely not. Um, and I will say, uh, I mean, that that's that's just a basic one that that I've found it works pretty well uh, over the years, as I'm sure. But I mean, what's, of other what's your have. technique when you're but, using Google? It's not you're not just asking Google because Google send you on a correct, highway to get you correct. Point A to yeah, B. Yeah. Yep. So there's the whole avoid highways thing um, on Google, which is a good a good little trick if you're looking for a, a different way to get someplace. Um, I think it's mostly good because it's so uh pervasive and and uh and and uh, comprehensive i guess street yeah. view you can always like check yeah. out an actual road exactly. if you're not sure what the surface is or what it looks like but i like. will say i will say the rever route planning thing is pretty darn good it's pretty cool how you can just kind of click you just sort of, like it's it's made for doing what we like to do which is to find interesting roads you know so it's made to just sort of click and say i want to go here and then i want to go here and then i want to go here and it just sort of follows your mouse and and then yeah you can just like pump it to your phone and and you know, clip it to your handlebar or reference it as you ride. It's, it is pretty nifty. And you can turn on the different colors so that you can say like, I only want to ride the most aggressive sport bike roads and you can just hit all the red ones. And then you can have to show me how to do that. Yeah. They have off-road as well. Um, I'm, I'm still a big fan of paper maps. I love pouring over maps and and checking out (laughs) rides. And I think that my technique has always just been to look for the squiggliest line on the map and take that. (laughs) I, you know, you don't even have to ride a squiggly road fast to enjoy it. It just, it makes it more dynamic on a motorcycle. Um, the other piece of advice that I've learned over many years is that your average speed at the end of the day, all things factored in is going to be close to 50 or 55 miles an hour. So if you're going to do a 300 mile ride, anticipate it taking you six hours. I know the speed limit on the highway might be 70, or I know you think you're going to do this, you're going to do that. It's just always shaken out that way as an average. Um, 
I'm and surprised. Also, I'm surprised it's 50. I would have guessed like 30. Like I feel like mileage <laughs> well, is always far if less. You're filming, Jesus. Oh, yeah, oh my it's god, like 15 miles start. an hour. No, I'm just talking about like if Zach and I are going to go ride to Monterey to go to Laguna Seca. Like even though we're haul and tail on like super fun back roads, it just works out that way at the end of the day, and that's that's stood true over lots and lots of road trips. Especially the, if you're going to hang out at McDonald's and talk to Clyde. Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to say. And part of the reason is I would also suggest do not overbook your days. Like, if you're going to somewhere new, and I, to be clear, I've been helping a number of people tour California recently with just recommendations. Don't overbook your days. Give yourself time to stop and take pictures. If you, like, ride by something and you're curious about it, give yourself time to stop, turn around, look at it. Stop and sit in the grass. Stop and walk on the beach. Take a stop photo. Stop and read placards on the yep. side of the road. Yeah. Take a photo. Sniff like the daisies. Yeah, you're, you're doing this because you enjoy it. You're not just trying to get from A to B or else you'd be in a car or you'd take a plane. So like, give yourself plenty of time in your itinerary to just really soak in your surroundings and, and experience it fully. I used to, I like, I still do. I'll have a little travel tripod that I'll take. So like you can set the, the little tripod up and then you can get a picture of yourself in front of the <laughs> motorcycle with where you're at. So you're, it's not just yeah, the pictures sure. of the bike and the scenery. Um, right, so totally. what's your, so what's your average mileage a day? So recommendations, like if you had to say like ideal mileage in a day to enjoy the ride and to be able to still cover some ground, like what do you recommend from a mileage standpoint? No, I mean, if it's less than 800, depends. I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what are you doing? Like what, are, what why are we even leaving the garage if we're not doing it? Uh, iron butt every ride. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I think that for riding around California with the roads that we have here, um, 300 to 400 is good for a day ride. But if I'm doing like multi days, then like I'll probably trim that back a little bit to around 300. And especially if you're two up, um, reducing yeah. that mileage is important. I think that's two actually, up is entirely. Uh, that's a whole other podcast. Just how a, to, it how it to is a whole other yeah. podcast. Yeah. But but just to quickly say, uh, if you're traveling with someone. Whether it's a person on another motorcycle or a person on your same motorcycle, but especially if you have a passenger, definitely add some or More reduce your average stops. speed again. Yep. I mean, you build <laughs> yeah, you sure. build endurance. I mean, Zach yep. and I have spent just countless hours in the saddle, whether it's on a Dumb and Dumber bike or on something more comfortable than the Dumb and Dumber <laughs> bike, which is essentially everything. You get like you get used to it. Just like if you're you know if you're an avid runner or someone who flies a lot, they're just scenarios that you get used to. And at right. this point, sitting on a motorcycle for six, eight, ten hours in a day, like really doesn't phase me, even if it's multiple days in a row. So yeah. you hit you hit something that was key, Zach. I think you mentioned it. If you're riding with someone else, not not a passenger, but if you and and your buddy are out on a motorcycle right. trip, have the conversation ahead of time. Like as part of the planning for the trip, say like how many miles do you like to ride in a day? Yeah, that's important. because if you're riding with someone that wants to stop every 20 miles and like, you know, stop at this watering hole or stop here and look at like, yep. and you're the kind of person that likes to go 150 miles a stretch at a time, you're probably going to have some, some real, going to be some conflict. Bad be some friction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a, that's a great recommendation is to be like, you True. know, hopefully you know the person before you go travel with them because <laughs> that'd be, that'd be a good thing to understand. But yeah, if you've got entirely different expectations of what the trip's going to look like, that might, uh, might be problematic. Yes. Yeah. This, this uh, circles back to some, High side, low side relationship advice. Uh, uh, relationships are, are organic things. They need to be nurtured. And you need to be clear about your expectations in in them. No, I, 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 think I, is, I agree with you though. I think that the 300 miles a day is a great is a great planning point for anyone listening that's never done a motorcycle trip. Like I think 300 miles a day is a great average to to aim for because if you try to pack in too many, it mm. does it does take away a little It'll bit where you, you feel out. like you're just chasing yep, after the miles. Rush. So yeah. I think that's a, I, 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 uh, I don't want to cut anybody off in case it has any, any final thoughts, but I think that's a great, great way to end is to sort of like, don't rush through it. This is a, something you're, 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 you're supposed to be enjoying. And I think, if you I to think get the there, kids say thinking, YOLO <laughs> yeah. and it's true. <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy yourself. Like make it, make it worthwhile. Indeed. Uh, I, I, I hope that there's something in what we just talked about for the last God knows how long it was. Uh, because I think that was a good conversation. Yeah. Agreed. And hopefully, yeah. if nothing else, we've inspired you to get out on your motorcycle and take a yes. ride. Whether it's yeah. a whether it's a one day trip or it's a ten day trip, or you get to go do, uh, you, you know, quit your job and sell six all your months possessions. and drive around in a Bandit <laughs> six hundred. Um, hopefully, you're you're inspired to get out and, and ride your motorcycle uh, this weekend. Uh, by the time this is releasing, it'll be well into the spring. So hopefully, the ice is thawed, no matter where you're at in the country, and you get to go out <laughs> and, and ride a little bit. So with that, uh, we've got some some audience comments that we want to get to. But before we do that, we need to say goodbye to Mr. Ari Henning. Oh shucks, yeah. As always, wonderful chatting with you guys, and yeah, this is a great conversation, and I hope the audience uh, enjoys it. And like you said, is inspired to go ride their motorcycle somewhere. Agreed. Thanks for hanging out, man. See you soon. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Bye. Later. Always good to have 
uh, our colleague Ari Henning on the program, um, but we have gotten rid of him, and that means that it's time <laughs> to jump into the high side, low side comments section where we go through all of the emails, we go through all of the YouTube comments, and we pick out some of our favorites to read out loud on the air. The first one comes in from Andrew, who wrote an email and said, Hey, Zach and Spurge, love the podcast. Usually listen during work as a New York City truck driver. You guys always make me laugh during work, which I appreciate. So first and foremost, Andrew, Thanks, Andrew. we're glad we could make you laugh. Yeah. Um, question from Andrew says, I'm a larger rider. I'm looking to ride a larger motorcycle, but I don't want to buy a bike I can't handle. Uh, he's currently riding an MT-07. It's his first bike. He's mm -hmm. thinking about an MT-10 or a 1290 Super Duke, uh, and he wants to know if it's too large of a jump. He's mm -hmm. become very comfortable with an MT-07, but is not interested in an MT-09 or Duke 890. So, Zach, what right. do you think? Right. This is a great question, um, and I love that Andrew uh, is thoughtful enough to to come up with this, like, well, I know I don't want too much engine, but I also like a, a, a bigger rider and I want a bigger bike. I think that's totally, totally fair. Um, so th there isn't a, <laughs> there isn't a by the book answer here. Realistically, normally would always advise, you know, not buying a bike that has too much horsepower. Um, but I think the fact that you're being thoughtful about it, Andrew, really suggests that you're probably not going to, to, you know, jump in over your head. Um, and I will say that something like I, 1290 Super Duke is a bike that I love, but um, in, in my head, an MT-10 um, is maybe going to be a little more comfortable for you. Uh, it's a pretty comfy bike, in my opinion. Um, and as Spurge pointed out um, to me a couple days ago, the engine dynamic is arguably one that'll be a little bit um, less severe coming from a smaller bike. Is that right, Spurge? Yeah. So if you're looking at like the, and I was specifically referring to the MT-09, the MT-09 has, I feel, oh, true, true. has a much more aggressive torque curve than the right. MT-10. Um, mm -hmm. And then with the, like the Duke 890, it spins up really fast. Uh, the Duke, the Super Duke 1290 is just on godly. Um, and I would say that out of all of them, the MT-10 with an inline four is a bit more forgiving off the throttle. It's got lower, you could put it in like rain mode and start off in rain mode and, and kind of get used to the, the power as it comes on. But it, it definitely has more mid-range once it starts to wake up versus like an MT-09, which has, I think peak torque is at like just below, they're just past 2000 RPM. So it comes on much more aggressively. Right. It's easier to get away from you. Right. Yep. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's, I think that's a, a good observation. And, um, and it does bring up the point of sort of like buying big bikes because you're a bigger person. Um, but, but, you know, want, and, and it's, it, it's interesting when you think about it, what's a, what's a bike, like what's the biggest bike you can recommend with the least amount of horsepower in your, I mean, like an American V twin, I guess, <laughs> realistically. Um, but yeah. it sounds like Andrew's thing is sort of like naked bikes, you know, um, but the problem is then you, you, you with with big with larger cruisers and you're getting higher weight too and that becomes yeah, true, that true, becomes true. unmanageable yep. in, in its own way. Um, it, it could be. It could be. Yeah. I I one other bike I'd throw in there and I know this isn't on um, this wasn't on your list and I think it's an adventure bike so it's it's maybe not exactly what you're after Andrew but um, but Honda Africa Twin is a bike I throw out sometimes because it is a a full size bike and if you're a full size rider you'll fit on it pretty well um, and it's very capable. And uh, I think it's darn handsome for what it's worth. Um, but it's also the engine, um, while full size and having plenty of power, is mellow and and easy to use. And I like that about it. So in case that helps, that's it. I would say question. too, one of the you know, and and I, he doesn't give us his exact measurements, um, nope. and he he also doesn't let us know if he's shopping used or shopping new. But you could also get a, a previous generation uh, speed triple. Um, which which could be a little bit more manageable as well and might save you a few dollars. But I think if we're just going off of like his question about MT10 and right. Super Duke 1290, I would I would vote out of all the four bikes that he listed here, I think the MT10 would probably be from from Yamaha. For those of us not familiar, the MT10 <laughs> from Yamaha uh, would probably be my my pick for Andrew as far as the one to jump up to. All right, there you go. Um, and Andrew, thanks for so much for the email and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Um, a driving truck in New York City there, and thank you so much uh, again for listening. Uh, I'll, I'll take the second one here, Spurge. Go for it, my friend. This comes in from Dawson. I love his Dawson. Greek. Oh, 
when I, when I was in college, I would go and every TBS Sunday, I'd tune into the every, creek. Every Thursday night, crime yeah. time or whatever it was. Uh, Dawson says, um, hey guys, I'm a new writer. Really excited to get into the culture and experience uh, the freedom that bikes bring. My first bike is a 2019 Kawasaki Vulcan 900. Orange and gray, of course, says Dawson, which I'm guessing is a reference to Revzilla colors. Is that right? Is that I, ju- I just on? think he likes the orange and gray one. I, okay, well, I, hey, yeah. orange and gray, is a, yeah. that's a good, good color combo. Um, question being, uh, so Dawson says, I know you guys aren't huge fans of cruisers. I, again, necessarily, again, he goes necessarily. Necessarily, yeah. but if you had to pick a cruiser or a sport cruiser to ride exclusively for a year, what would you pick and why? Um, would you still pick function over form? Would you make any modifications? Love the podcast. Keep it coming. So, Spurge, what do you think here? If you had to, if you had to pick a cruiser or a sport cruiser to ride exclusively for a year, what would yeah. It be? And just to clear, because I, I feel like we've talked. I feel like we talk about this in every episode. Um, I think <laughs> as a taller rider, I have a hard time at times because cruisers just aren't necessarily as comfortable uh, for for me to ride. That being said. I actually like a Vulcan 900 is a great motorcycle. Um, when I was living in Tennessee years ago, I worked at a multi-line dealership and uh, Kawasaki was one of the brands that we carried. I thought the Vulcan 900 line was an approachable bike, still plenty of power, uh, very comfortable to ride all day. Um, I, I think, and it's also a little bit on the smaller side, so it's more manageable. I think a Vulcan so if 900 you had is to a pick, bike. If you had to pick a cruiser to ride exclusively for a year, it would be a Vulcan 900 then. I would actually, I would honestly like, I would probably look at the Vulcan, uh, what's the Vulcan S? And that uses the parallel twin 650. Right, 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 right. Okay. I like what the like idea. I like the idea of that bike a lot. Um, I, I like the fact that there's like the ergonomic system that you can change the way the ergos fit. Uh, if I was going to modify it, I'd probably be looking at maybe doing a set of mid sets, uh, like, like mid set, uh, foot pegs, foot controls. Um, yep. Would I still pick function over form? Again, I, I think that that's one that is a little bit lighter. It's a little bit smaller. I could ride it a little bit more sportily. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I'm still yeah. picking function over form a little bit with that. What about yeah. you? Well, I mean, you know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the daily rider, right? I'm the, I like, I like using, using a bike every day all the time. And so, so some sort of functionality and, uh, and, yeah, I, I I can't help but lean in that direction. And of course, I like uh, I like bikes that are powerful. The that'll blow my hair back. <laughs> um, uh, my two favorite cruisers that come to mind off the top of my head are the Triumph Rocket Three and the um, Ducati Diavel. Because I I and and in part it's because reasonable they're, they're fast and they're... reasonable machines. You know, <laughs> well, the, smaller displacement. Not, uh, no, especially Rocket Three is really just a kind of a gargantuan. The bizarre motorcycle, but I, I do love it for it is the Diavel, you know, it is, it is fast. Sure. Um, and I, and I like that it can handle, but I think really what I like about it is the, the riding position. I like the, like Spurge said, the kind of mid set controls, you know, Ducati went with sort of this somewhat strange, uh, hybrid riding position for that cruiser. Um, and, uh, it very much looks like a cruiser and it's got the wide rear tire and everything. Um, and you feel you got your, your you sit in this, the cruiser slouch when you're on the bike, and it's the, I think you sort of look and feel like you're riding a cruiser. But but uh, it's a little more comfortable, I think, and um, gives you a little bit more uh, direct command over the bike. And so that's the, honestly, if there was a if there was a Diavel 800 or something with a smaller engine in it, I think I would love I think I would love that bike. It, it's it's not necessarily the the power or the sort of flagship nature of the Diavel that I'm drawn to. It's really the the the, the sort of basic setup of the chassis that I find compelling. And I, I know that this probably isn't a cruiser, um, but <laughs> I think oftentimes, you know, I've been, I think when I look at the the Bonneville uh, Street Twin line, I think that sport bike folks are like, that's a cruiser. And cruiser folks are like, oh, that's like a standard. And I think it's yeah, in this yeah, yeah. weird like interim. <laughs> yeah. But like right. that's still to my, to my, to this day is is one of my favorite motorcycles. If I had to pick something that was probably not sporty esque and not fully cruiser esque, the Bonneville or the Street Twin is still my favorite seating position. It's just like an upright yeah. standard seating position that I can ride any way I want to. So that's a, oftentimes a bike that I recommend for a lot of people that are somewhere in between where they want to be, or maybe they're just starting off like Dawson here and they're not sure which direction they want to go. 
So right. So yeah, I mean, Dawson, you can tell we lean more toward the sort of practicality and and a, a little bit of um, you know function over form. Hopefully, that doesn't disappoint you too much. Um, uh, but I think that uh, you know the, the good news in that in that space is that there are, are there are a lot of options. Um, and if you're not as concerned about the type of function that that we often concern ourselves with, then then especially there are, there are lots of options to, to to pick up to move on from that bike if that's what you if that's what you aim to do. Yeah, but I think the Vulcan 900 is a great bike for you, Dawson. Mm-hmm. I think that's something you're going to be able to spend a lot of years on and and have a lot of fun uh, mileage on. And, and you know, to the whole point of this particular podcast, hopefully you can throw some bags over there and get out and have a road yeah. trip with it and really you know enjoy the motorcycle for what it is a a freedom machine, freedom of the open freedom. road. Exactly. Exactly. All right, you've wasted another perfectly good couple hours of your life. Uh, with us for some reason um thank you so much for that we are forever indebted to you a uh, friendly reminder that if you're watching or listening on youtube please leave a comment below with subjects you'd like us to cover or whether or not you like spurgeon's hair um or send us an email to high side low side at revzilla.com um and one person in particular should send us an email to high side low side at revzilla.com yeah the winner today is steelboy925 shoot an email over to high side low side of brazil.com and we will make sure that you get your free t-shirt sent out let us know what size t-shirt you want and we will put that in the mail and get that out to you and for those of you that have not already done so go ahead and please leave us an apple podcast review you might get a t-shirt out of it but more importantly uh if you like the podcast you help keep you help us to keep doing what we're doing um, because we like doing it. So with that, I think we have successfully given you another installment of High Side Low Side. We are halfway through <laughs> season five and uh, we got six more episodes to go. So we'll see you then. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.